Hello, everybody. Welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm, week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, and welcome to my kingdom. I'm joined, as always, by my homunculus, which I have named Scott Daly. Scott, say hello to the people. Long live the new flesh. I could not stop laughing, Matt, during that whole thing. I tried to be serious. I tried to be serious. I am almost crying from laughter. Um... As you said, this is the podcast where you, a worm expert, guide me, a first-time reader, through Wild Bill's world of superheroes, supervillains, and everything in between as I inspect, interpret, and yes, even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, Matt, we are covering part one of Arc 26 Sting. This covers six chapters, chapters 26.1, all the way through 26.5, including uh, including an interlude. And this Matt um, is is a very interesting one for me. At least this this first half of it. There's there's a lot going on here. We're, we're seeing the Slaughterhouse Nine return in a big way, and um, you know I had I, I I was not. If I'm being honest with you, I was not looking forward to this. We've kind of been building up to the Slaughterhouse Nine return idea for a while now, and I was very worried that this is going to be you know kind of re treading ground that we've already covered before. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised that it was not, um, that, yeah. that we're doing some of the, of some of the s- very similar things, but we are doing something new, fresh and exciting with it. Yeah. I generally avoid trying to prime you on things, but, uh, this was actually one of the sections of the story where I was, I was thinking, I, I remembered enjoying this less than other parts. And, and I was thinking that this might be one of the ones where we're just like, oh, you know, this is, this is, a. Uh, this has this has some issues, but but actually on this read through and and analysis, um, I I've enjoyed this a lot more than I remembered enjoying it, and it's possible that I just uh, I don't know was rushing through it or something. But um, yeah, it, it's it's funny how much more I enjoyed this than I kind of expected to. This is one of the ones I was I'm not going to say dreading, but I was like, oh yeah, we, and then we have to get through the slaughterhouse a, a lot section and actually it's pretty fun <laughs> yeah yeah and i think i think that's one of those things where when you you know on, on a very surface level we are we are retreading ground we are the jack's plan here is a a larger version of jack's plan with the recruitment game and, and taylor's strategy for beating him is a larger version of the strategy that that was used in the beginning. So there is very much a similarity here, but when you look, when you dive into the detail of it, you see what it's doing and you see the purpose of it. And so I think that's where our project can really pull out the things to appreciate where, as, as you were saying, a speed read or, or just normal paced reading uh, would not necessarily do so. Yeah. The context of everything that's happening, I think is very different. So, um, and there's more than enough to talk about, certainly. Yeah, which we will uh, definitely do. Yes, we will. But first, a, a few announcements. First, a fan art context reminder. Uh, the On the theme of uh, Yamada Saves the World, artwork is due on Wednesday, November 22nd by 11.59 p.m. Is that central time? Yeah, sorry. That central is time. central time. Yeah. That is my yeah. time zone, so that's the one I set. Um, yeah, well, it is central. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, yeah, and I think we're just going to keep reminding you guys of this Um Throughout the, the contest, send your artwork to us at our email at uh, gotwormpod at gmail dot com, and uh, looking forward to see what you guys got. So I think that's all the announcements we have this week. But yeah, just want to yeah. keep uh, keep plugging that one. Yeah. Other than uh, the Worm Two Prelude continues and and is great. So check that out <laughs> if you somehow don't know about that at this point in time. Um, so yeah, some comments and questions this week. Um, so Scott, uh, you you said something about. <laughs> Did you say something? Did you say something about anime last week? Um, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um. So last week I said two words that stirred <laughs> quite uh quite a discussion on both the Reddit. Um, we received emails from people, comments on YouTube, on the Reddit, um, comments in our Discord channel. Um, because I said anime sucks, and 
I've got a, a few things I want to say to to clear the air, as it were, about this. Um, I generally do not like anime, um, but I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with liking anime. And I have I have my very specific reasons for not liking the things I like, and I don't hate it all. This is not a I refuse to watch anime, I won't do it type of thing. This is, you know, I've watched a lot of things and I've not cared for them, but there are some things that I've cared for. We actually, um, Matt, we did a whole podcast about this where you, I, and Michael, I think it's episode twenty five of the Daily Planet podcast, where you guys had me watch Death Note, and we talked about. Uh, Death Note specifically and the things that I do not like about anime generally and and how Death Note had those things and and hurt my enjoyment of it. Um, So, yeah, maybe I should have provided a little context. Um, Yeah, I I mean, I don't I don't think it was on you necessarily. It's just it's funny to me because to me, you saying anime sucks is like kind of an inside joke. And I kind of forget that listeners of our podcast aren't aware of all of our inside jokes because um yeah you know especially if they watched episode 25 listen to episode 25 they would kind of get what you know that you were referring to something and you weren't just taking a a random pot shot at their at their hobby or whatever yeah Um, yeah and and that's like it's also something i do because you like quite a lot of anime michael likes quite a lot of anime so in this in this group in this uh company as it were i am the odd one out here so i take pot shots at anime because i am the minority in this and um, I'm constantly being told, no, you're wrong. And I, I want to make it very clear to everyone. I, I am not attacking you. I think it's great that you guys are passionate. Like I saw your passion, the amount of posts we got, the emails we got, you guys are so passionate about the things that you like. And I love that. I love when people are passionate about art. I'm passionate about the art I like and seeing people, even if I don't like those things makes me happy. So I, I am not attacking you. I would never ever judge you in any kind of way for liking the things that you like that's not what we're about here at at all it's just it's just something that's not for me and i there are there are anime that i like i like miyazaki a lot i've said this before i actually have miyazaki's collection the whole thing sitting right here on my desk um but most of it it's just not for me and that's that's okay so yeah yeah that is okay. Yeah. And now I'm glad we've permanently laid this to rest and anime, anime gate will never <laughs> uh, be mentioned again. <laughs> until I say something and, else. Until you say it again. Until I put yes. my foot in my mouth once again. Yep. So we had a, a great comment from Sir, Sir Graug, uh, again, uh, basically wrote an essay in the thread this week and, and it's all wonderful. We recommend you go check it out in the Reddit thread. Uh, they touch on bone saws interlude and the super complicated ideas of redemption and forgiveness. Yeah, and I'm going to do that thing where I just read what people say sometimes because okay. I want to draw attention to it. And I think it's one thing to say, go to the Reddit and look at this. But it's I think I want to draw one of my most favorite things here is is the discussions that happen on our thread. Some of it mm-hmm. related to some of the things we talk about. Some of it's just people's personal feelings. I think Seer Grau here wrote this had had prepared this prior to our even even our podcast even coming out so this was just something that they were passionate about and talked about and that's great um so he's talking about about bone saw and the idea of redemption here and says that's what makes someone irredeemable that they deliberately and continuously make the act of choice to not stop what they're doing a bone saw that stopped doing all the awful things she's done wouldn't be the same person as one that continued she'd instead be well riley It wouldn't change what she has done, but it would change where she's going. If we assume some sense of free will, I find this both uplifting, but also daunting in a way. The main barrier to changing yourself is yourself. And I think that's fantastically well written. It's very true. Um, And I like this idea because it reflects last arcs. Taylor, you know, thinking of about Alec and thinking about the things he's done and, and sacrificing himself certainly didn't make up for all the bad things that he's done, but it, it was still something and has to be counted as something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the, that bone saw interlude as exactly as an exploration of that concept and, and um, don't really have anything to add. It was a great comment. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. if you haven't uh, gone to the Reddit thread and check that out, we really recommend you do. Um, it's the whole comments. Great. And, and of course, as always, there's great discussions going on in there. We cannot, pull them all out here even though we would love to we'd be doing a whole episode on that but the the level of of 
conversation and discussion and analysis that goes on in that thread continues to amaze and and excite me so thanks guys yeah. thanks for continually yep. doing that throughout this whole project and like you said that was your favorite um your favorite interlude probably one of my favorite interludes it's it's going to generate some some good discussion yeah um next a question from dark glass uh, for me specifically uh, Matt, what are some examples of time skips being used poorly? And I, I'm I'm 100 sure this is being asked because when we were talking about the time skip last week, I said um, if you can avoid having a time skip, then avoid it. Otherwise, if you have to have one, then try to do it the way Wildbo does uh, does it here. Um, mm-hmm. and so so you know, there's two jump to mind immediately, and I'm pretty sure there have been others, but it's it's not even. There's a very specific way, and I think I mentioned this last week, in which in which I think time skips harm the narrative, and that is that it it deflates your connection to the characters. So one of the time skips is in Naruto, the anime, where you have like the first anime, and then there's a big time skip of a few years, and then there's the second. Uh, actually, the manga. I read the manga. I didn't even watch the anime, honestly. Um, um, and what happens is you really you lose your connection to who the characters are because they have developed and you didn't see that development. And so you're playing catch up. And in a sense, you're never really entirely sure what aspects of the old character are retained and what, in which are discarded. So you're almost, your, your brain doesn't know quite how to deal with it. So it almost throws the baby out with the bathwater. Um, another example is uh, the Baroque cycle by Neil Stevenson, where there is a time skip um, late in the book and, um, I guess that's probably a spoiler. Sorry, but um, it it leads you it's exactly the same way. The characters are different now, and you almost feel like, oh, I was halfway through through this extremely enjoyable story, and now I sort of don't know these characters anymore. It's a bit like seeing a friend who you haven't seen in you know five years or something, and you, you know you you absolutely don't just slip right back into your old groove because you've both changed in in small and large ways. And on top of that, you're not sure how they've changed. So everything's very tenuous and you kind of have to ease back into it. So it's an interruption. It's an interruption in your connection to the character. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was well done. I haven't seen or read either of those two things, so I can't really weigh in. But um, I was trying to come up with my own answer for for this, and I I really wasn't able to. Um, I haven't seen it used that often. I was trying to think of, of... uses in in television um and it's not used very often there either but i think it's it's i think it's probably even worse in tv than it is in books because you have such a a less of a window into characters in in television because you can't see their thought process a lot of the time so um you kind of you disconnect from the character even more when it's used in in a visual medium yeah that makes sense all right uh that's that's cool let's move on into the beat by beat discussion all right let's do it so we open 26.1, and the heroes are entering the town of Killington. Um, several wards are accompanied by the Undersiders and the Red Hands. And I just wanted to comment that I think I'm just going to call all of these guys heroes because they're all heroes compared to the people they're fighting. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think, you know, at, at this point, <laughs> this point in the story, the, the literal... Um, labeled definition between hero and villain has kind of gone away. It's people trying to end the world and people trying to stop the world from ending. And mm-hmm. like, we we don't need to throw these labels out anymore. Like, and I think that's an interesting change in the story because even even when we were fighting Endbringers, we were still taking the time to say the villain, the hero, even though they were working together to stop a common foe. I think that's kind of gone now. It's just, do you want the world to continue to go? on okay yes well then you're on the, the good guy side now like that's that's where you are and i think that's yeah interesting yeah and similarly last time they fought the nine basically there was almost no overt cooperation between wards or, or, or prt and undersiders in fact the prt was trying to undermine the undersiders and, and the travelers um and and now the undersiders the red hands and the travel and, and the uh and the wards are being led by the same person yeah, Weaver, yeah. so which goes to show once again that, you know, one of the things I've been I've been looking for in this is finding out what exactly Taylor's plan of 
leaving the undersiders and joining the wards, what has it accomplished for her? And and this is kind of it now that because she's now moved to being head of this group of villains, now into pretty central to this group of heroes, she can bring these two groups together in a way that no one else could before because she can be that middle ground. She can be that link between them. And that's what we see her do here. Yeah, she really has turned herself into what she needs to be for this for this challenge. Yeah, yeah. And for for good and bad, I think. Um mm-hmm. yeah, the one thing I before we go on, I like we've seen through that this book some pretty horrific stuff. Um you know, from from the, starting with the craziness of Bakuda to to Contessa just kind of murdering people with ease and then we have the Endbringers and the death and destruction they reap. But like the Slaughterhouse 9 is its own thing it's like a part the the disgusting disturbing horrible nature of the slaughterhouse nine is unique and the first few sentences of this chapter bring us right back into that bring us right back we're back in the horror movie now and we're back in this this whole different kind of thing and and i i was i was sad i was i was happy we moved away from this and now we're back and it's just like (laughs) oh yeah this is what this feels like hooray yeah Right, I forgot this story had this in it. Yeah, yeah. The psychological warfare against me as the reader. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as they move in, Weaver becomes irritated with Kozen's inability to handle the horror that she's seeing. And Weaver thinks about the role she herself played in making the Undersiders into the formidable group that they've become. Yeah, and I think there's a couple different ways to look at this. I think we see Taylor kind of very hostile um, to the point where it kind of smells like jealousy again. Like we, we saw a little bit of, of Taylor's jealousy for Cozen at the beginning of the chapter or beginning at the end of last arc. And now we're kind of carrying that over again here. Um, but also we see that different Taylor again a little bit because she chooses to, to take this, this example of, of Cozen's unpreparedness to kind of dive inward and, and turn it introspective and say, what was my role in shaping these people? How how have I transformed the Undersiders into what the Red Hands were are right now into what they are now? That what what the Undersiders have become this deadly, dangerous group of people. How much of this is am I culpable for? And that's a theme that I think we're going to carry through a lot of this. This idea of of the the people that you surround yourself, how they shape who you end up becoming, and 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 that's something that we're going to touch on with all these different groups as, as Taylor kind of moves through it. And, and I think, I think Taylor's kind of like regretful in some places, but for her part is like willing to also measure the good and bad parts of this. She recognizes that like she did, yes, have a part in making the undersiders out of that cops and robbers game and putting them into this dangerous lifestyle that had this horrible result on Gru that, possibly that like she kind of blames herself on some level for Regent's death but then she also gives herself credit for for rachel that she took this person and and has improved their life so i mean i think we're seeing we're seeing her being able to recognize the good and the bad instead of just blaming herself for things yeah there's definitely i i think she deserves to take credit for for rachel in in some ways um she's kind of kind of bringing her back into being a functional person yeah um, I think we should also definitely hit those beats where where we see how Golem uh, has been shaped by Taylor and perhaps how Taylor's been shaped by Golem. Maybe that's less clear, but I think we can probably find some evidence of that. Yeah, yeah. And I think we're going to see how, how Imp has been shaped by the past few years and the things mm-hmm. around her. I mean, I think Nilbog in a few chapters is a perfect example of like his like he's quite literally shaped the people around him, but that control and that yes men attitude has shaped him like there's so many different Mm -hmm. examples of that throughout this yeah yeah that that be where they talk about how his voice has been has been warped from from being cartoonish all the time yeah yeah yeah. Uh, that's cool so yeah they're they're making their way through the city and it's full of numbered dead bodies all mutilated and strung up in creative ways weber is able to tell that the distribution of the bodies throughout the city is a spiral shape which will force the heroes to trek through this demoralizing nightmare escape on their way to whatever awaits them at, at the center. <laughs> Fucking Jack. Fucking Jack. Yeah. Uh. I know. Uh, as, they're, as they're going, um, Weaver comments that they need to be careful, and Imp 
adds that she likes being careful. Yeah, and and what a great little character beat, right? I mean, this is clearly a very different imp than we've seen before, and it's it's very obvious that that Regent's death had on some level a pretty profound influence on the person she's become. And then that combined with, like we just said, um, it grew's being grew being the leader of the Undersiders. That that Taylor stepping out of this role and and grew the careful, you know, conservative grew taking over again has has shaped her, has changed her on some level. And and Imp now more echoes her brother a little bit here. Yeah, I'm also reminded of the fact that the last time she encountered the Nine, she stepped in a bear trap, and and was partially responsible for her brother's trigger event also. So uh, she's true. probably a little bit, little bit gun shy. That's true. So yeah, uh, Taylor thinks, speaking of Gru and, and Gru's trigger event, uh, Taylor thinks about how Gru is doing and, uh, you know, especially considering who they're fighting. And, uh, you know, as the reader at this point, I was frankly surprised that Gru is here at all. Um, yeah. And, and, and she's thinking if it had been the nine back then, uh, sorry, it, it, it had been the nine back then, and though he wasn't giving me any clues, there was something wrong. He wasn't indicating that he was his old self from back in the good old days. I suspected he hadn't fully bounced back, even after all this time. Might never. Yeah, I like this a lot, and and you're right that it is kind of surprising that he would be here. And, and it's Gru is always this kind of mystery, and and you wonder like how much of his choice to be here stems from actually working past that trauma and how much of it stems from just his complete inability to show any sort of vulnerability at any time. Like Gru is, is very much vulnerability is weakness and I cannot show that and not coming here saying he couldn't be here, saying he couldn't handle this could be perceived as weakness and, and Gru cannot let that weakness show. So, so that's why I think he's here. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good guess. I mean, I'm sure he was, felt you know black horror in his gut at the thought of coming and then someone said okay well uh, who's gonna lead us and then he had to be like i guess i'm gonna lead you because <laughs> otherwise you know and, and he's kind of right if he's if he's continuing to be a supervillain you know team leader then he has to portray an image of being competent and not being fearful yeah so. yeah absolutely they, i mean they kind of need him to lead here i think too as much yeah. as as much as he's going to be deferring to taylor here um yeah yeah because they're gonna have to split up eventually um so they de- they deduce that the nine have resurrected clones of their old members although at this point they don't really they don't know for a fact how many there are and, and which ones they do kind of guess that there are nine of each of the clones uh, based on the number of breed bugs i think because nearby a man well actually a skin sack full of breed creatures bursts open yummy uh, unfortunately, Weaver can't control the bugs. No, Matt. It doesn't. It doesn't burst open. They come out of his butthole, Matt. Oh. They come out of his butthole. Yeah. The body is pooping deadly <laughs> bugs. This is gross. Sorry, I skipped this nightmare image. I wish I, I think had. My brain just edits it out. I wish I had. So the so uh, getaway uh, uh, hero who's with them mentions that he's feeling out of his depth, and Weaver uses this as an opening to talk about how if people don't think they can handle it, they should leave. Cozen takes offense at this, which ultimately leads to Gru backing up Weaver, saying, "My orders are to follow her orders." <laughs> That's cold blooded, <laughs> Gru. Um, I I really like this so much. Um, we we kind of see Cozen and Taylor go into their own little uh, proverbial dick measuring contest. Um, and so we, we've seen Taylor's jealousy so far. Like we, we're in her head. So we like see how she reacts and her jealousy. But but Cozen so far has has like she walks right up to Taylor and, and says hello and is really nice to her and says, I've heard so much about you. And you think, oh, she's being really nice. But now that you know that Cozen is just kind of as jealous, you can go back and, and read her niceness as like going above and beyond to try to like prove that she's cool with it and you realize that both these people are just like intensely and uncomfortable around each other at all times definitely yeah um and and the most important thing here of course is that Gru doesn't back his girl up um Mm -hmm. so so last week we talked about how you know it was clear that taylor had not moved on that these people were still really important to her and maybe maybe the rest of them had moved on but i think we see here that that's not quite true that that grew 
has found someone else, but how, how much has he moved on? Like, it's very clear he hasn't moved on past his trauma and maybe he hasn't moved on past this fling either. Yeah. I think there's a case for that. Taylor, we don't, we don't see much of, of their interaction in here, no. but, but I, I, that beat by itself at least was, was uh, suggestive. Yeah. And then of course, when, when Gru does side with her and Taylor wins the conversation as it were, um, I really like this beat where she says, I turned away to hide my smile in case it could be made out beneath the fabric of my mask. And she's just like, like Taylor doesn't smile very much. So when Taylor does mm. smile, it is important. And this is, this is her kind of relishing in her victory over the current girlfriend. And it's like, we're, it's so funny cause we're in the middle of this, like the world's going to end. There are hundreds of corpses here, but still you got to get in your digs against the X and vice versa. Um, yeah. you just got to do it. I mean, there's oh, totally. still teenagers. Yeah, no, that, that's really funny that you point that out. That I'm, I'm now imagining her doing this coy little little grin while there's like 50 dead bodies in her line of sight. Yep, yep. Um, but this is just normal for her at this point, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So eventually, their group runs into a group of protectorate capes, and they talk about how the nine put anti-air traps in place so that the heroes would be forced to crawl, crawl through this trap field and become demoralized. And uh, she she thinks about how some kinds of people would be intimidated by this experience and some would be stoked to anger. Yeah, and that's perceptive Taylor once again, um, you know, kind of reading the situation absolutely correctly. And and I, I the thing I really like here and I wanted to point out is how she, without thinking of it, is like describing this and making comparisons in a way that everyone can understand it because she jumps immediately like to a, a dog raising its hackles like – to show like what's going on here and while that works metaphorically for all the humans to understand it also just happens to be the exact thing that will get rachel to understand what's going on here and and to, and, and she's doing like she doesn't even comment on the fact that she's doing it like in the past we've seen her specifically look at rachel and say here let me explain this in a way that you can understand but now she's just doing it as part of her overall explanation and, and this ties to the fact that throughout this arc we're we're going through this this Taylor, the facilitator, the coordinator, the administrator, and we're really hitting that hard. And and she's gotten so good at managing these teams and these people very quickly. And and that's another another hint of it, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it does seem like she she used that particular example unconsciously. And you know, the one thing that we that we did you know miss in in the time skip was uh, apparently you know a year and a half of solid her leading teams of wards and just taking out villain after villain after villain. Um, so she's, she's even, it's, it's almost like my sense is that everything about her character stalled except for the fact that she became a much better, much more effective leader. And, and she became a lot more laser focused and sort of honed toward this particular mission. Does that, does that match your, sense yeah i think so I, th- I think you're absolutely right and and i think that's again you know to defend the time skip that is a thing that we don't need to see the step-by-step passage of that effect we can just tell like we you can just see it like we see it now we didn't need to see step-by-step how taylor learns this leadership skill and this leadership skill like we've seen her grow throughout the book and we needed to get her a place where now she's like not only good at leading this group of villain people, but now she's like coordinated and, and awesome at leading all different kinds of people and in a much larger scale than had been before. And, and we didn't need to see that the passage of time to get that. We just needed to see it. Yeah, I agree. So they reach kind of the middle area of the city finally. And Weaver looks under a tarp and sees something that she doesn't think about. We don't know what it is. And she lies to everyone else about what's under it meaning that what's under it is worse than everything else that we've seen up to this point. Um, under the other tarp is a TV with a tape in it. And I have no idea. I have no idea what's under this tarp. I have no idea what the hell is so bad that in this wasteland of horribly mutilated dead bodies and torture corpses and, and bugs coming out of buttholes, what could be so terrible that she can't, that not only can she not say it, but she can't even think think it that's crazy yeah right moving on um 
Uh, so they're they're at the TV, and a man tells them to push play. Uh, they they kind of begin to, and then Revel tells her to pay attention to the guy who spoke. And it's it's, it's not it's not comedic in the moment. In the moment, you're like, uh oh, uh-oh. Um, because Taylor is simply not able to to respond to any orders that tell her to be aggressive toward the guy and and uh revels like this is what hell is like listen to me um (laughs) weaver can't conceive of the man as a threat at all and eventually Gru uses his darkness and i get the sense that that interrupts whatever the effect is and then imp executes the guy and kicks him down the stairs and we find this is a um a nice guy um and also weaver notices that imp can talk while using her power. Yeah. That's a cool little beat on, on how improved her power has become. But Matt, I really, I, Matt, I love this. I love it. I love how this is written. I love how casual and, and sudden it is that, that we're basically, you know, we're, we're in the shoes of, of revel at this point. We're in her point of view. Cause we see this person too. And we're like, wait, what's going on? Uh, like, who is this? Well, I, I like had to reread this multiple times. Cause I'm just like, wait, there's a, there's a man here what's what's happening and and being in taylor's direct point of view here enhances this so much more because like how casually she's like scanning over the man like that beat where where it's like no the person sitting next to you and she like looks past the man and it's like no it's not Gollum. and and poor revels just like no the guy (laughs) right there um it's so good and and if i can get like syntax nerdy again for just a second here um, Let's do it. One one of the the ways that Rob Wild Bill writes this, and and the first time we hear this man introduced is is when he talks and says the tape's already in the machine. You can hit play to start it, and it says the man sitting at the edge of the stairs said. And I think if you read that sentence, imagine how different it would have read if it if it was read as a man sitting on the edge of the stairs. And like you wouldn't think between the and a, there's that much difference. But if you read the sentence that way with a instead of the there it's almost drawing attention to his existence it's pointing out that he is new he's a man that's new here but by saying the by saying it's just this is just the man it's just the man he's been there always like he's not new he's just there and 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 that way of using the there just cements this confusion and like this casual nature of this guy and it's so well done like just one word, how it changes everything and cements exactly what Wildbo is trying to do here. It's great stuff. It's really good. Yeah, it really makes you feel similar to how Taylor's, you know, thought streams probably is because you're just, you're looking over things. You're you're not, nothing, it, it, it's, the man sitting on the stairs is not jumping out to you any more than the mailbox next to him. And and you wouldn't say, you you would just say like, I leaned against the the mailbox you wouldn't say i lean against a mailbox because right. that that almost that that you know you're you're right it is a very subtle and, and almost um um unofficial thing about language perhaps but but yeah it's it's it would seem it would seem weird if it were a mailbox yeah 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 nice guy's great uh, i love this power it's all it's all really really awesome yeah and i like how it's kind of similar to imps but different yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they start Jack's tape and he tells them um so so first of all he's like get Theo Anders, which is funny because he's right there. Um and then he he says uh, he's going to extend Theo's deadline because Jack was was late to the party. Um but so that nice. they haven't even started killing their 1000 people yet. The, these people that they've killed in Killington are just a warm up. So they have five more days and if they fail to kill Jack, he'll release the clones to just go go crazy um and also theo is supposed to be doing this without any help we didn't even talk about about how they started in killington which is just of course jack would pick a place named killington to do the killing in just hang out yeah, in killing it's, town it, it's 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 funny one of the first things you said about jack was that he seemed like uh, tell me if i'm remembering this right like he you were saying he seems kind of like pompous and 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 like isn't as smart as he thinks he is um yeah yeah something along those lines and it, d- choosing a place called killington perfectly fits that because he thinks he's being artistic but actually it's just like a stupid pun basically yeah it's like so obvious that it's just kind of like hack a little bit yeah 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 um okay 
so <laughs> I think like, we, we touched on this at the beginning of, of the podcast, but I think this is the point where I, I kind of said, oh, no, in, in my head as I was reading this, because Jack sets up his game and and it feels on the surface that we're basically hitting very similar beats as we did last time where we dealt where we dealt with the nine where there's this rigged game where Jack is basically able to cheat himself because his his deal with Theo was not oh you have to come kill me and also get through my 250 clones of all the most powerful members of my organization that was never part of the deal he made with him but Jack basically gets to cheat and then if Theo does he'll be punished and this again this feels again like just almost recycling um, what we did the first time with the slaughter, Slaughterhouse Nine, just just again, but more. Um, and in this moment, I was very concerned. I was like, "Is this? Am I going to find this interesting? Is this going to to do enough different for me to like it?" And uh, s- spoilers, yes, um, it does. But but this was the moment that I was I was like I was starting to get a little worried, and and that fortunately did, did not last very long at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think I probably shared that concern. So yeah, they um they discuss at this point now that they have Jack's message. Um we we get some information about how obviously they're not going to um they're not going to make Theo do this by himself because that would be ridiculous, but they're going to try to hide the fact that they're helping as much as possible to kind of slow down the rate at which Jack starts making things worse for them. They also discuss how they're going to treat this as a Seamurg situation, basically quarantining important individuals and dangerous individuals and powerful capes away from Jack and away from the fighting. Yeah, which, of course, um, serves as a good in-world explanation, but kind of also is a very convenient way to remove the the most powerful capes from the game. Um, It's like, again while both finding a solution to a problem that is natural and world fitting, but also solves, uh, solves the problem that no, we can't have these three here because we can't. And instead of just like writing them out or ignoring them or pretending they're not there, um, like every Marvel TV show does when you're sitting there like, wait, why isn't, why isn't Thor and Iron Man helping this time? Where are they? They actually, yeah. it actually comes up with a, a reason for that. And I, I, I like that. Yeah, me too. Tattletale thinks that Golem is being set up with a long series of lose-lose situations before the end. Um, but luckily the heroes have a head start because they have gotten to this point faster than it seems like Jack expected. Yay, I think. <laughs> I think yay. Um, this is, again, I think we, we talk so much about the first episode, or the first chapter of an arc setting up the, the, not only the themes, but kind of the the, the recurring beats that we're going to hit, and this is something that we absolutely hit multiple times. That that this this apparent victory that ends up not really being a victory at all. Like it's like this idea that hey, we we did this faster than they do. We have the advantage here. We have time on our hands. But really, I mean, it's just kind of an illusion. It's just like it it doesn't matter. Like Jack has rigged this game. No matter what you do, like you're never really ahead. Yeah. We'll see the truth of that by the end of this section, I think. Yeah. So at this point, now that they've watched the tape, Golem, Theo just kind of wanders away and Weaver kind of worries and thinks that he's leaving, but he's not leaving. He's, he's just choosing to let all the death around him affect him. He's choosing to think about those, those deaths and those people. And he says, he's not like Weaver. This, this combat, this struggle doesn't excite him. He's not like he's not like Jack either, for that matter. But Weaver is, um, and he says she thinks like he does, and and she thrives on conflict like he does. Yeah, this uh, I I really love Golem Matt. I, I really do, and I think what he says here is really wonderful. I love that he 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 lays it out kind of for us, and I think he's absolutely right that that Taylor and Jack are two very very different sides of the same coin they they thrive on that complicated acting on doing on on going and and i think what golem says here is really great that it it doesn't it doesn't make taylor a bad person it doesn't make her bad the good side the, the people trying to save the world need people like her need people that can do the things that she can do um to succeed and you and i have been echoing this this kind of thought since she first defected since she went over to the 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 protector at side and and theo kind of sums it up nicely for us and mm-hmm. and man like 
like Theo, how far he's come. Like he was this, like the first time we met him, I was shocked to find out he was Taylor's age. Do you remember that? Like that he was characterized as, as so childish and so immature and, and so much less prepared for the truths of the world. And now like this line, when he says, I'll fight when the time comes, wade through the gauntlet he sets in his wake and I'll succeed or fail, but I'm not a strategist. And these people need someone to mourn them. Let me be useful in my own way right here right now and that's just like it's wonderful let these people need someone to mourn them theo can be that person he can be that type of hero he can't do what taylor does he can't be that type of person but he can do this and he does it and that's it's a fucking hero matt that's awesome that's awesome I noticed a lot more on this read through and, and I think it also helped uh the audiobook voice voice actor does Theo in kind of a kind of a, a very intense, almost like Western gunslinger type type uh intonation almost where you, you really get the sense that he's grown into this extremely serious man where you know that like that 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 those lines you just read, they're very they're dramatic without being over dramatic. They're just they're just very serious, and yeah. you can't imagine little little baby Theo um, saying those things. I don't think. No, no, not at all. Yeah, I mean his yeah. his growth and his change and his his heroism coming from this place is it's wonderful. It really is, and yeah. and I'm I'm so happy to see it. I'm so happy he's gotten to this place, and and he's about to go through a worse than he could ever imagine, but. But he's coming from it from a heroic place, and I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, but in contrast, Weaver pushes the dead out of her mind and, and moves back to the mission because she has to. She needs to. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's interesting here because the text kind of goes out of its way to compare Weaver and Jack, and that that comparison is fairly obvious. Uh, the, Theo lays it out right for us. But what about that comparison between Weaver and and Gollum? Uh, because these these are two people working towards the same goal. Um, and they approach it from a very, very different place. And, and again, it's not that Taylor lacks compassion. I don't think, I don't think she's not experiencing compassion. It's just that she doesn't have a use for it. She doesn't see it as useful. So she shelves it away. Whereas Theo, on the other hand, sees, sees like what a lack of compassion can do. Like if you look at his past, if you look at what he's seen as his father, this, this idea of otherizing people, of treating them as less than human is is why Theo's dad is the racist Nazi scumbag he was and and Theo cannot otherwise Theo to Theo compassion and and humanizing and treating these people as people who have died who deserve to be mourned is the most important thing and it's the one thing that he can do and Taylor chooses not to do because not to do that because she needs to not do that because her role is different and I, we we fit into our own roles, and our roles re- require some stuff of us. And I think Theo has a really good good grasp on that. Yeah, I think he is sort of pushing back against nihilism in this way. And I, I, I wouldn't say Taylor is embracing nihilism, but she you know she did see something terrible under that tarp that was so bad that it that it caused her to have an emotional reaction about yeah. it. So she's she's not completely cold to these things. But she did very quickly kind of brush that under the under the tarp, as it were, and uh, just move on. Because in her mind, you, you know, what's the point? Like you basically said, what's the point of mourning these people if you're the time you take to mourn is just costing more lives? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think Theo is not willing to to say that. He he's he's saying, look, you you have to you have to hold on to your humanity through every step of the path because the moment you set aside your your humanity in order to accomplish the mission it's not like you just pick it back up and everything is just like it was supposed to be yeah and and the the reason i love this so much is because i agree with him and i think he's right but he doesn't come out of place of judgment he's not judging taylor for her uh, proclivity to do that for her to to set aside her humanity and to set aside these people that have died in order to accomplish her thing. But he is, he is saying that this is the way I choose to do it. This is the way I can do it. I understand that you need to do it your way and we need you to do it that way. So like he, he doesn't judge her for it. He's not calling her out. He's just saying, this is what I believe and I have to do this. 
and it's it's really good it's really good yeah yeah he probably also thinks that he'll be more effective if he if he processes the way he needs to process it but, yeah because yeah. not everyone can masterfully compartmentalize like taylor can yeah that's true exactly so we move on to 26.2 and the heroes have incinerated and quarantined killington to deal with the traps weaver is going over her notes yeah how's she going over her notes matt did she put Braille all over her notes and she's just reading via bug? Yeah, that, that's probably another another one of those things where it's just a very mi- mild hint that her her use of her power has continued to grow in creative application while we haven't been with her. Yeah, and, and you wonder like how how much she can process at the same time doing it that way, right? Like is she can is she able to read multiple pages at the same time through her through her ability to multitask? Probably. Like how fast could Taylor read Worm? I wonder. Yeah, I wonder. probably a few a few seconds. Well, I don't know about that fast. <laughs> Matt, it's really long. It's really yeah, long. It would probably be a pretty big printed out on Braille, actually. Yeah. Also, yeah. if you're reading every single part of it simultaneously, I'm not sure if you're really going to get <laughs> what's going on. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we need to ask Waldo about this. This is important. Okay, yeah, this is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah gonna burn our one ask wild though uh, card <laughs> on this yeah uh so defiant shows up and he's even bigger now taller and, and bulkier he's obviously made some improvements to himself and he's a total fucking badass that's mm-hmm. the, the description of this is like awesome like it's it's such a great a couple paragraphs where we describe what he's become and and i am officially not going to say anything bad about defiant anymore because he's about to have just a really really bad day Mm -hmm. it's a really awful day yeah so defiant tells her that somebody will eventually let something slip and the plan that they're cooking up will fall apart the goal is just to get the good guy forces to coordinate and get through as many of jack's obstacles as possible so golem can get close to the end goal you know i I retract my not going to say anything bad about defiant already um thanks for your optimism here buddy really appreciate it (laughs) yeah this got me the the, the, the defiant weaver interactions are always great yeah 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 this got me thinking i went down the rabbit hole of what like if someone put defiant in charge of the pre and bringer fight speech what that would sound like (laughs) and here's here's my image of it it's well guys we're probably gonna die end of speech and that's that's it that's it you're right i think it's probably good that he found his his niche here yep and uh did, didn't rise through the ranks of the protectorate yeah so he tells her that there's a 93.8 chance that the world ends now and apparently that's that's worse than uh, than they were before um largely because they've obviously missed various possible opportunities that they had to kill jack up to this point but if they do kill him in the next 24 hours the odds get much better although things always end up bad later down the line yeah um like like you were hinting at the 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 relentless positivity that come when when taylor and defiant are in the same room having a conversation just warms your heart doesn't it um we're basically screwed um there's nothing we can do and then of course (laughs) taylor decides to once again ponder about what would happen if we just wipe out a large a large corner of the country Theoretically, if we nuke northeast corner of America, Defiant responds, only a 60% chance of working with some decimal points that Dragon's urging me to include as I speak and a high chance we'd set thing in motion anyway. 28 or so. He asked Dinah, I thought to myself, the same question I had in mind, give or take. So, <laughs> so they both independently of each other wondered, what happened if we just like nuked half the country? Would that solve the problem? <laughs> God, yeah. God damn it, you two. It must be really relaxing for them to be around each other because they don't have to pretend <laughs> not to be complete fatalists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're getting on their, their ships and, and she sees some of the dragon's teeth who are all heavily armed mundanes, like lesser versions of Defiant. And it's mentioned that the the um, dragon-Defiant combo have leveraged Masamune's power to um, basically create all this tinker gear that these guys are wearing to manage the upkeep of it yeah um they, they sound pretty cool dragon's teeth kind of like super prt soldiers and matt mm-hmm. how much you want to bet that they have cont- containment foam sprayers on their on their suits how much you want to bet, bet they do. 
I bet they do. I bet, bet they, they do. do. You know why? Because it's fucking useful. <laughs> no, I can't argue with that. Can't argue with that. So we meet the Brockton Bay Wards again, which is just delightful. Um, Vista now has like a particle gun. Clock Blocker has a power armor with like a power gauntlet. And Kid Win is basically a Warhammer 40k Terminator. Uh, so he's clearly overcompensating here for 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 something. Um, Matt, what's a what's a Warhammer 40k Terminator? I don't oh don't know what that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how about a Warhammer 40k Dreadnought? No, I don't know what that is either. Oh, no, he's a big he's a big robot guy. Okay, well, thank you. That helps. Why don't you stop using all your weird nerd lingo and let me talk in detail about the difference between the and a? Because yeah, that's the okay. important thing. That sounds like a worthy use of our time. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to fit in as many Warhammer 40k references as I can in the rest of this podcast now. See, I know what it is. I just don't. <laughs> just don't know what it is. So as they as they head out, no dying. I said as everyone started moving. No dying, others echoed me. The voices of the undersiders and the Chicago wards were loudest among them. That's a nice little beat, right? Like that, yeah. like, the, the, I like how the undersiders and the Chicago wards were the loudest. Like, those are her, the two teams she's she's developed the most uh, of closeness with. So I, I imagine her echo, like, saying this every time they go out on a mission or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, so so then the uh, the Brockton Bay wards sit across from the Undersiders on the uh, dragon ship, tensely. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's kind of like when when like your old friends come into town to hang out with you, but your, all your new friends are over, and they both know you really well, but they don't really know each other very well, and everything's just kind of really awkward, and you're all just standing there looking at each other, and then also you're about to to die. So there's that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've all been there. Yeah, all of us. Yeah. So, so we get to this point where Taylor starts talking to her passenger, which you get the sense it's something that she's done um, now and then because a lot of time has passed. And uh, it says, "Passenger, I thought been a while trying to figure out how to make peace with the fact that you're there, that you're affecting me somehow, taking control whenever I'm not in my own mind." I think we've made strides. I've sort of accepted that you're going to do what you're going to do, whether that helps me or hurts me. Yeah, and I think acceptance is is another big theme of this arc and and kind of increasingly of Worm as a whole as we approach the end. And and we see Taylor kind of accepting that her passenger uh, is going to control part of her no matter what she does and is just trying to steer her and negotiate the best way. Um, and some some other beats of acceptance here theo accepting his role and everything and and taylor kind of accepting hers um and and then also this idea that everyone kind of knows the odds we've all accepted the odds and the chances and and we're willing to act anyway so i love that this beat of acceptance as we move into this incredibly dangerous game they're about to play yeah me too yeah so as they fly in into the next target they conclude that winter and screamer and probably cherish too are here so Screamer's power is that her voice doesn't get quieter over distance. So they start having to use passwords to deal with the fact that Screamer is copying their voices and kind of causing a lot of um, 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 deceptive orders to be given. So I, I don't know why, but this power skeeved me out the most so far. Um, just the idea that like someone can whisper into your ear from miles away and like in different voices and... Uh, it just terrifies me. We need to kill all these things immediately, right away. Please. Yeah, yeah. When when you think about it, it's it's pretty disturbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I also like the beat that Watson just follows Golem around in his telekinetic form, and they make everyone think that that's actually Golem's power. <laughs> yeah. Remember when, back when when we've got Worm first started, and we talked about that a little. We talked about the idea how capes could use what people did and didn't know about their powers to their advantages um and how how important keeping that stuff safe was um you know making up fake powers hiding powers you do have it's been a while since we've seen that kind of play out in any kind of meaningful way but but we do see it here and it's a great it's a great little beat yeah yeah i think you're right um there's definitely definitely a bunch that come to mind like the the 
how the Siberian's power works, for example. But uh, yeah, but yeah, 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 you're right. I, I enjoy that they actually use it offensively here. So Screamer tries to torment Weaver, but Weaver figures it out, and then and then as soon as Weaver figures it out, Screamer cancels her voice, so she can't actually say anything anymore. So she copies your voice and gets it so far into your ear canal that it sounds like it's just your own internal narrative, which is, it's worse, Matt. It's worse. This is terrifying. I don't like this. I don't like it. Yeah, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty awesome. I'm going to have nightmares about that. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Well, I think that was the idea with this whole section. Well, good. <laughs> Mission accomplished. So then they move through um, the building... Uh, and it's full of dead or dying people slowly losing their life force due to winter's power of torpor. Um, Crimson is there and he's a, a giant brute and he's, he's strong and durable and he kind of feeds on people to become stronger and more durable. Golem fights Crimson using his power very intelligently, using a lot of tricks that we haven't seen before. It's almost like he's been training at it all this time. He vaults himself through space using a cool technique where he shoots one smaller hand through the palm of a bigger hand that he creates. Um, and and ultimately, Weaver throws her silk cords and caltrops into Wanton's maelstrom, which helps bind up Crimson. And then they kill Screamer and Cherish by collapsing the building on them. And then uh, Foil shoots the Chuckles, but he gets away. So there's a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, Golem traps Crimson in an alley and cages him with his hands, and they kind of seal him away. Yeah, uh, not too much to say about all this action stuff besides the fact that I think it is it is very, very well done um, to pick up, you know, that thread that we talked about in the last chapter about Slaughterhouse Nine. But again, um, Wildbow does a couple of things that are really smart here. Uh, first, I think besides besides Cherish, we open up the battle, this this preliminary battle with the Slaughterhouse a lot um, with with people that we've never seen fight before. These are all new members that we personally have never seen in action before. So um, we face Winter, Screamer, Crimson, all these new people, even Chuckles, who we barely see. Second, we also use this as an opportunity to show Golem's improvement, show after all the training of that last arc how much better he is. And, and he's quick, he's sharp, and he's powerful. So, so yeah, we're getting at this idea that the basic idea behind seconds uh, behind behind Jack's second game here is similar to that first time, but the players are so different and the execution is so different then that it doesn't feel repetitive. It doesn't feel like we're just hitting the same kind of beats over and over again. Um, and I think that's very clever. Yeah, I, I really think that the all these horror movie themed um, villains are, are doled out to us in a very efficient way where. We get just enough time to see how scary they are. We see how they fight. We see what they can do. And and then they're defeated. And, and they're never really defeated in a way that makes them seem like they were chumps. It's usually more like it's showing how good our heroes have gotten and, and how prepared they are. Right, right. And, I mean, I, I think we take all that and then we transport it into the next chapter, which is, like, literally haunted apartment building invasion squad ghost hunter force x um and it's <laughs> right. so good yeah yeah so speaking of which they they get word that the next challenge uh is actually two locations so the heroes are gonna have to split split locations um and and so it's, we open 26.3 and um we have weaver and her team are choosing like you just said the oh, the haunted house and, uh, and the other team is going to the other location so they're preparing for this bout, and Weaver has called in Crucible and his team, and he kind of obliquely complains about being ordered to show up to this, and Clockblocker points out that it wasn't actually an order, it was more like a request, um, and that he should have denied it if he wasn't up for it. This segues into a conversation about the rumor that Clockblocker has the hots for Weaver. Um, so basically, the, the first part of this chapter is, you know, we we saw the wards were there last time. Now we're catching up with the Brockton Bay wards and catching up with the Undersiders at the same time. Yeah, and it's all it's all really it's all really wonderful. Um, in the midst of all this this tension and violence and death, we have these nice comedic beats here again. Um, I really like this part from Clockblocker when he's talking about uh, the the rumors about him and Taylor, where he says some dingbats online speculated that I had a thing for Weaver and it took off. These people online like to find stuff that fills in blanks. 
and there were a hell of a lot of blanks around the whole thing with Weaver defecting and our pseudo truce with the undersiders. Matt, I was literally one of those those dingbats online. That was that was us. That was us. We did that. Yeah, we did that. It's true. See, but I have I have my own biases though, Scott. I, I think I think maybe Clock Blocker doth protest too much. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think you're probably right. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so, and then he also adds, uh, the only thing keeping things remotely interesting is the challenge of trying to get to any new bad guys before the undersiders do to enforce real justice instead of vigilante justice and scare, uh, vigilante scare tactics. Yeah. And so we see here, this is the first beat that, that clock blocker is, is fundamentally changed from the person he was the last time we saw him. And like his career is hurt. He's not even leading the wards anymore. I guess crucible has, has taken over the, the guy that they were making fun of. The, the last time we saw them, the kind of the butt of the joke guy is now leading the wards instead of Dennis, who is kind of being groomed for it. Um, and and like it, it, this reminds me of that whole beat where like Taylor like swooped in here and like fundamentally changed everything and made decisions and then left. And Dennis's whole complaint was when she did that, like she would leave things behind that suffer like she would make the right choice at the time but things that she wouldn't would wouldn't stick around to see suffer for it and here we're seeing dennis is kind of his career his life is suffering because of of taylor's choices yeah yeah you're right um and we're not even done yet <laughs> um yeah yeah um it goes on uh don't worry clock blocker used to be the funny one vista said now he's the asshole grown-up that tears the funny kids to shreds. Clockblocker didn't respond to that. Instead, he shifted the device he'd been wearing on his back against the wall and sat down between the elevators. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, this 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 was really sad to me. Um, I mean, Vista's Vista's joking. She's telling a joke, but like, if you look at Clockblocker's arc throughout this book, he was always that funny, sarcastic one, and and, and we've seen him kind of struggle with losing that person as things get tough for him. Like if you think of arc 10, we see Dennis kind of struggling with this idea. Like, like he, he's starting to become this, this dour sullen type of guy. And then um, it, like Leviathan and his, his father's sickness. And it seems to be going that way for sure. And then like with the frustrations with, with Taylor and everything. And then we see him kind of under, get to understand Taylor. And you see that l- little glint of that old Dennis comes back like he's hilarious in all the scenes with Taylor's trial period with the wards. He's really funny in there. He's really great. He seems to be that same sarcastic guy that named himself clock blocker just because he thought it was funny. And then two years later we see him now and, and he's, it seems like that dour depressed defeated Dennis has kind of won out that, that life has beaten him and it just, it just kind of bums me out. Yeah. He seems really downtrodden yeah. and, and, and eventually they get to talking about the end of the world, actually. Um, f- first, though, we, we kind of take a break from that to look at the uh, the building, which has been completely sealed and is, appears airtight, sealed up by this tacky red resin. Um, and, th- and they know there are hostages inside and they're trying to think of how to get in. Yeah. And like like we hinted at last chapter, this is um, kind of a, a wonderful contrast to the previous battle. We are, we are not doing the same things. We are not the same players, the same setting. All this is changing, and all of it is different and exciting and uh, terrifying. Very scary. Mm-hmm. Yep. So then um, they move on to the world-ending situation and their various ways of dealing with it psychologically. Um, and from from Clockblocker, once again, we're getting a lot of these Clockblocker beats. He's saying, uh, I think it's a joke. Humanity destroys itself, and all these powers... They just open the door to let it happen. It's not going to be some villain overlord or even a monster like Jack who does it. I'm more liable to believe the world ends because of some deluded, fat, pimply-faced punk kid that lives off pizza and Mountain Dew. There's no damn point to it, but sometimes I look at the idiots, the selfish assholes, and the maniacs that fill this world, and I think that's all we deserve. And, and then Imp, of course. I, I like your line of thinking, Imp said. The world g- gets destroyed by some loser who jacks off 12 t- times a day to the freakiest, nastiest pair of humans. Thank you, Clockblocker said, for so eloquently demonstrating what I was saying about us deserving it. <laughs> so that's funny, but 
also super depressing. Like Dennis yeah. is just like humanity sucks now. The end of the world is inevitable. Like we probably would have destroyed ourselves anyway, even if we didn't have powers. But powers are just our tool to do it. That's it's a fucking bummer to see this yeah. character reduced to this. Right. He's he's like the grizzled fifty year old detective who's who's seen everything and and dealt with everything. Yeah. And uh and and has no hope. He he's 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 Morgan Freeman's character in in Seven at this point. Oh my God. You're right. I mean I mean basically with what he's seen. What's in the tarp? Yeah, I mean that's that's just scratching the surface of what these people have all seen, actually. So the um, <laughs> so at this point we learn that the red hands have fled like cowards. <laughs> um, the undersiders and the other heroes are still helping though. And and we have another awkward Gru Taylor moment where we very clearly telegraph how not over him she is, very very clearly. Yep. Uh, they also chat about Foil and Parian's relationships, speaking of relationships. Um, yeah, that's a, a nice little beat um, that steers to the uncomfortable from Imp very quickly. Yeah. Um, the Kid Wynn says, now I'm going to start wondering what someone with pseudo-invisibility powers gets up to in her alone time. She's gone there, Guru said. I looked at him and saw he was glancing my way. Lies and slander. Wait, Clock Blocker said, I thought i heard something at some point about you being her he trailed off hmm grew asked train of thought derailed what were we talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm glad i'm really glad we take a, a little bit of time for a comedic relief before we go into the haunted house like it's really it's really necessary i think and this is really yeah. wonderful right well i mean what that that never ceases to be funny to me and, and part of it is that Imp is actually so embarrassed about this that she just kind of expunges the memory of the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which goes, I yeah. mean, again, I think it goes to show uh, not only her, the fact that she's grown up, but the fact that she's changed that yeah. I, I don't think Imp would make that same choice, would do that same thing again as, as the adult that she is now. Yeah, I agree. So Weaver splits up the team. Perry and Foyle and Kid Wynn will hang back and provide support, and the rest will go in. And they're expecting ten of the nine in there. Yeah, I, I, the, the thing I like most about this beat is that, um, like they're going in and they and they expect ten of them, but we also go over to to Golem, who's also expecting like ten of them on his own, and he's just gonna take them because he's a fucking boss. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, so Gru encases the whole building in his darkness. I, I think this is actually a really awesome image. This like shell of of his of his perfect darkness growing up and over the sides of the building, and then they start trying to get into the building and find that glaciers of ice gush out to fill any fissures made in the building's integrity. And they guess that this could be a different manifestation of mannequin's tech. Yeah, you know what this? I, I imagine this ad because we we take the time to say that like it's covered in like a red shell. It reminds me of Ghostbusters 2 when the museum is covered in the pink slime. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, it's probably not like that at all, but I just I just had that image in my head and therefore Gru's darkness surrounding it became a proton pack in my head because <laughs> I love Ghostbusters. Even the second movie, which is bad, I still love it though. Yeah, comparing things to Ghostbusters always makes it better. It's true. So Weaver infers that the building is set up with a highly pressurized outer shell and the interior is probably safe and at normal pressure. Vista merges the outside into the inner core, keeping the high pressure outer um, um, thin, thin membrane intact. Gru is able to scout out who's in there by seeing what powers pop up in his awareness when he pokes his darkness around and Weaver does her own scouting with bugs. Yeah, and now we're in full haunted house mode. We're wandering around in the dark. There's monsters around every corner. I imagine they're like being creepy noises that they're not placing and all this terrifying shit. Uh, it's great. Yes, this is extremely atmospheric because, uh, well, first of all, we learned that there are mannequins, murder rats, breeds, and the hatchet face hybrid somewhere in there. And and again, yet again, we're getting the powers of all of these nine characters that we that we may not have met yet doled out to us in chunks yeah and, and once again we mix in one that we've seen before with a bunch that we haven't i mean i know we've seen murder rap never like in action before so right. like we're, we're we're all of it comes off as fresh because you have yeah we've seen we've seen mannequin but all this other crazy shit combined and and it's 
that's good and it's, it's engaging yeah, yeah. so yeah they, they go in there they fight mannequin uh weaver is surprised that his costume looks the same as when she knew him and they defeat him uh next they find some breed victims and then a murder rat starts to sneak up on them and this for me was the point where in my notes i just wrote in all caps god this is such a good horror movie <laughs> And and it really is. We have rat hybrids, monster bugs, scary mannequin people. Like it's literally horror, and 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 it's just horror that happens to have superheroes in it. And I this is this is a good opportunity for a random tangent about how superhero is really not a genre, and superheroes can exist within any genre. And you could absolutely do a horror movie with superheroes. I actually think they're doing an X Men horror film. I can't. I think it's the New Mutants film is being made a horror film i think and i think it's a really cool interesting idea and i think this kind of proves how well it can work because you can still have things just as terrifying and 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 all all that horror imagery but also superpowers yeah yeah i mean it it certainly convinced me here so murder rat dives down and she nails grew with her with her spikes and knocks him down slices vista's face and also crucible and bastard Clocklocker tags her, and uh, and then Vista's wound is is smoking and looks really bad. Another mannequin and murder rat start closing in from above and below, scraping their respective claws slash blades on the on the metal railings. And there are also breed bugs coming in through the gaps, and it's just so intensely terrifying i love it yeah it's surrounded on all sides by all these different kind of monsters that are scraping and crawling like this is so visceral and and i think this is another one of those really cinematic moments but this is also like we've talked a lot about these cinematic moments that i can see but this is one this is one that i can hear like the, the 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 attention to detail with with the noises that are coming out of these things like the the dog growled as another murder rat joined the fray her clawed feet clicking against the steps as she made her descent the screeches of her claws against the concrete joining what was click, quickly becoming a cacophony the blades at the fingertips of her other hand struck the bars of the railing which set them to ringing i mean like the amount of noise that has to be in this place at this time just this all different kinds of terrifying noises all coming together with the bugs and the mannequins. And it's, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. It, it strikes me as being cinematic in a way where you're the, the focus is the actual audio. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can imagine the, the camera kind of going between close ups and then up the stairs, down the stairs, you hear the sounds, you hear the sounds. Um, yeah. It would be, be pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. So they decide to just, the heroes decide to just attack. So we see Crucible's power. He creates force field spheres that turn into little crucibles. Yeah. So for the guy being like the butt of the jokes as the new member of the war, it's like, fuck, he's really yeah. deadly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So at this point, it's just this crazy, brutal melee. Um, everybody's just fighting tooth and nail. Um, while they're also being dogged by these breed parasites crawling all over them and trying to climb into their mouths. Yeah, I think brutal is the absolute right word here. You know, once again, we've seen death, destruction, and carnage, but but this is this is up close. This is physical. It's personal. It's it's real. I mean, I mean, look at this. Look at look at how this is described. That that crucible shouted something incoherent as he used both his hands to stop a softball-sized creature from advancing on his mouth. Its millipede-like limbs left bloody tracks in his skin as it made excruciating progress towards the orifice. They are literally being swarmed by these things, by murder rats, by mannequins, by all these different monsters. It's so good. Yeah, I, I, I really I forgot how much I like this part, honestly. So Telltale calls in and tells her that Idolin is heading their way, and in the midst of this fight. Um, in the midst of this fight, it doesn't look like they're winning, actually. Weaver tells her to call him off. Um, while continuing to fight, she creates a swarm clone outside <laughs> uh, and tries to use it to talk to him. Uh, the fight ends basically when Gru ends up stealing Hatchet Face's power, which um, removes, uh, removes removes everyone's power. But his main goal is to remove Murder Rat's power. So then he once she's kind of depowered, he, he grabs her and... Um, kind of carries her away so that kind of solves the fight um and then outside taylor's talking to idolin and says yes leave you're more danger than help i can end this 
So can I. I will end this. Your choice as to how. Do I handle this situation myself, or do I have to kill you, then handle this myself? Fuck. Taylor yeah. doesn't think I don't want his shit anymore. It's like <laughs> casual, like, do I have to deal with you and then do this? Because I'm yeah. going to fucking kill you too. Like, yeah. holy shit. Yeah. It's uh, it's amazing. Um, but she kind of, she, she calls him off. She says, uh, you know, she's, she's persuading him. She says, maybe arrogant of me to say so. The swarm was quieter as my fine control swiftly dissolved. But I've recognized that ugliness, uh, sorry, I've recognized that ugliness and I've got it harnessed. She's talk, referring, of course, to her own um, capacity for doing harm. Yeah, yeah, because his argument is you could be just as bad as me. And there's there's so much to read off of this conversation, Matt. I, I think this kind of plays to me as like this very, very subtle foreshadowing, like, like th- this idea that if someone as powerful as Eidolon is turned by Jack, someone that couldn't be stopped, that that, that itself would be the end of everything. And, it, and, and they're specifically talking about Eidolon here, but my mind, you know, immediately went back to Scion here because I, I think I speculated chapters and chapters ago when we first learned about Kevin Norton, that, um, when the power of, of to control Scion was passed on to someone else that Jack could swoop in and, and, ruin slash convince the new person i forget what her name is what i don't remember um the, lisette huh lisette yeah okay thank you yeah. um yeah that 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 if he got a if jack got a hold of her then that's 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 the end if he can convince her to tell scion to do something terrible and that's it so that i mean that that really to me feels like what we're what we're setting up here we're kind of confirming that a little bit in in a subtle way um but but on top of this we have that arrogance that comes from Taylor that she, she calls it arrogance itself, that, that she's got her ugliness on lockdown, that she's completely harnessed and controlled it. And like, I don't, I don't know if that's true because I don't is right. Taylor can do what she did to Alexandria on a massive scale. If she wanted to, if, if her passenger wanted her to do it. And, and we've seen that she acknowledges the fact that her passenger sometimes takes control of her, that sometimes does things that she doesn't want. So this idea that she's super confident that her, she's got her passenger on lockdown, that, that she's got her, the evil darker sides of her under complete control. Just that arrogance feels so dangerous to me. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, it's a really, really interesting dialogue between the two. It's it's hitting a lot of these um, these themes of of the, the these characters who who want to be want to be in, important and want to be in control, but also have a dark side to them, which is something that she has in common with Idolan and, and in common with with Alexandria back in the day. Um, you know, and, and Idolan kind of directly mentions that because you know after after she she basically has won the argument and he says uh, I, I live for this he said it's what i do yeah yeah and we were talking about acceptance earlier and this is another thing where where idolin is 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 kind of accepting that this is who he is and 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 taylor says this is not a boast it's an admission of weakness and it's this brutally honest moment from her and this is this is all he is this is all he lives for and I think that's again we go back to that that Taylor Jack comparison that the, these fights these stakes they gives these people purpose and they don't know what to do without it and um and and like you can imagine if someone came right now and told Taylor no you we don't need you leave you you are not part of this what that would do to her you can imagine I mean we saw a hint of it just when when the seamer came after after behemoth died that she, how frustrated she was at, at feeling useless like it, I, you can imagine what Idolan's thinking here yeah yeah absolutely I, I I like that we have this 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 uh similarity between these two characters in this moment because I don't think I don't think we've ever really directly drawn comparison between Taylor and Idolan before but um it's very apparent here yeah, I agree. Yeah. But yeah, she does finally convince him to leave, which is obviously a huge, a huge blow to him, actually. Uh, so, so inside the building, they finally get to the hatchet face, but they find that it's not hatchet face. It's a hatchet face king hybrid, which is called Tyrant, which is, which is great. <laughs> um, he has King's damage transfer power plus hatchet faces power nullification. 
So to deal with this, as she's kind of about to be killed, she guides Foil's shot using spider silk, and Foil shoots. Uh, I think I think Kidwin kind of like blows off the side of the building, and then Foil shoots and, and manages to uh, to nail him because apparently her her um, her bolts can still penetrate his power nullification field. Yeah, you kind of forget that that the three of them are still out there, that they did not come and engage, and then suddenly it's like boom, hole in the wall, boom, shot dead win and it's a pretty great capper to a, a very fun action scene yeah yeah so she uses her bugs to find the breeds that are hiding amongst the hostages and crucible kills them mercilessly then inside the coffin that they've known was in the building the whole time they find jack uh, but it's not really him it's actually nix's power um in fact nix herself um pretending to be jack so they make a deal that she can go free if she tells them uh, what Jack is up to, and she tells them that he's on his way to Ellisburg, and just after Clockblocker has given his word as a hero that they're going to let him go, that they're going to let Nix go, uh, they don't, and Crucible <laughs> kills her too. His word, his word as a hero, Matt. His word yep. as a hero. This is uh, we we've been talking about Clockblocker this whole chapter, and. And now we see in this moment that he gives his word as a hero and, and betrays that word almost immediately. And and once again, this is the last beat of how much this guy has changed. And this kind of seals it. And the question that's interesting to me here is, did, did, does he feel that he straight up lied? That he just said a thing that wasn't true? Or did he does he not even consider himself a hero anymore? And therefore giving his word as a hero actually is a meaningless promise that that has no value to it. And I'm, I'm curious what you think. Um, it, it really, I mean, there's no real support one way or another, but it's interesting to, to talk about at least. I, I think the latter, actually. I mean, I, I think he, I think he just doesn't value that term anymore. I think that was part of yeah. his struggle was, yeah. was realizing that, I mean, it, and it's not all, it's not all negative because he, he's, he's witnessed what, Taylor did specifically and seen, you know, she, she was always sort of pushing back against this hero villain nomenclature and saying like, look, you, you can call me a villain if you want. I did villainous things, but I was doing them to protect people. So, you know, whatever you want to call that, I don't really care. And, and clock blocker himself is like, yeah, I mean, the, the priority here is to stop the end of the world. So I'm going to say literally whatever I need to say to get the information that's going to, that's going to lead to that. And, if I need to, uh, you know, that my my word as a hero is worth nothing compared to that, and I think that's actually just pragmatic. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I can't even really hold that against him. Well, and, and I think it fits in his like his general frustration with being hero because like mm -hmm. a, a lot of the beats of him was like I don't understand how like we're supposed to be the good guys, we're supposed to be the ones going out there and 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 saving the day and controlling the thing and this this general frustration he had with the fact that Taylor seems to be doing a better job at being at doing a hero job than than he is. And you take that and you extrapolate it over the course of two years where he admits himself that we the protectorate we the wards of brockton bay don't even really do anything any anymore because the undersiders have have such a lockdown on all the bad and crime areas of the city that the heroes are basically neutered that that, that they they are useless so he is kind of completely like done with the idea of of the hero villain dichotomy so i think that that absolutely does fit yeah, you know, I'm just I'm just remembering that he he referred to what the undersiders do as vigilante scare tactics. So he, and I just think that's just stuck out to me just now because he used the word vigilante, not villain. Yeah, when they're you know long-standing usage of villain to describe the undersiders, but he's I think he's just past that. I think he's over it. I think he's over the whole hero villain thing at this point. Yeah, that's that's a great pull. I, I hadn't even put that together. That yeah, he doesn't call them villains ever. That's really great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so back to the back to the book, uh Nilbog. That's where we're going. Hooray, we're escalating again. So we've gone from one site, now we've gone to two different sites, and now I think we're we're moving on to three and we're just going to keep going. We're just going to keep going. Yep. I I, I you know, I really want to get to the Nilbog stuff. That's some of my favorite, but first, Scott, a detour, uh an interlude. <laughs> With uh, everyone's favorite character. Ah, no, wait. That would be Cody. Ha, ha, ha. 
Yeah. Um, so this is the Saint arc. We're going to talk about this. Um, I think you and I have basically agreed to wait till the end of the chapter to weigh in on the controversial decision and our opinion on it. Um, so just like kind of wait till the end of the chapter for that listeners, please. Um, I want to encourage everyone to be nice to each other in the comments <laughs> on this week's podcast. I understand this is a very divisive decision that's made and people are very passionate about their sides. And I think that's great, but be nice to each other, please. That's all I'm yeah. asking for. It's, it's all, it's all in good fun folks. <laughs> so yeah. So Saint is watching dragons data feeds as she deploys Azazels to the locations where the nine clones are likely to be. And we learn that she's been using a botnet that she supposedly shut down for, for surveillance for her own purposes. Yeah, almost as if like the AI has completely just surpassed all its rules and limitations and now is literally betraying the public's privacy for the sake of doing good. So, mm. so remember when I was all paranoid about AI arcs ago and now suddenly the AI is, is just ignoring laws because it needs to for, the, for goodness? Um, yeah, and it's almost like some some moral ambiguity is being injected into Dragon's usually unimpeachable character at this moment. Yeah, and I think I think uh, while we're not going to to weigh in on our opinions of the decision that is made in this chapter, I think the important thing to note here is that the reason why this is such a controversial decision is because every beat in this chapter, every important narrative beat, is giving one side ammunition and. Walpo is very specific here in how he says this is this is how Saint this is ammunition for why Saint was right to do what he did and this is ammunition for why Saint was wrong and and there are you could you could cherry pick and find evidence to support your opinion littered throughout this chapter it's everywhere every single beat is supporting one side or the other and I think it's supposed to be as ambiguous as possible yeah Definitely. Yeah. But yeah. We, we can talk about what we actually think later, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the one thing I want to mention is you mentioned specifically that, that Saint is the point of view here, that Saint is watching Dragon's data feeds. And that actually um, isn't exactly clear at first throughout this entire first part of the chapter through Dragon's could kind of intercept with the, the Slaughterhouse Nine. Um, I was fully convinced we were just in her head. And it's not until we actually kind of pull out from that and realize that it was just Saint watching this the whole time that that doesn't come till a bit later. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. Um, so so anyway, she uh, she finds some Cherish clones on a bus using her surveillance system. Uh, a whole bunch of clones, actually, and, and probably some other of the nine. And she just completely fucks them up. It, it's almost <laughs> it's it's almost comical uh, and a huge contrast to how hard the heroes just had to fight in the last chapter. The Azazels bring to bear overwhelming power and coordination while risking practically nothing of value. They even managed to save the hostages, I think, as, as far as I could tell. Yeah. Um, the the nano thorn weapon can even kill the crawlers. Uh, even the one who temporarily gets nano thorn powers, they still manage to 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 do the rope a dope and, and kill him. Um, they even non fatally capture King with containment foam so that his damage transfer power can't hurt anybody else. Foam's pretty useful. It's mm -hmm. pretty useful. Yeah. So it's just a complete complete beat down and you can't yeah. help but feel like it's being contrasted to how hard everyone else is having to work oh absolutely it's very intentionally showing like how easily and how powerful she has become um and 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 that's good for the good guys as long as it's not turned against them in some kind of way. right yeah yeah I, I love this this is a particularly double-edged one because on the one hand you're like you're like oh it's good it's so terrible to take dragon dragon out of the fight because she's so helpful and 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 powerful but then the flip side is yeah look what chance would our hero stand against her based on this level of power yeah uh, and, and and i, I like <laughs> We just last chapter had this whole conversation between Idolan and, and Taylor about, you know, what happens if there's someone that's so powerful that we can't defeat, you know, seizes power. Like, we're very, we're very, I think, deliberately drawing back to that, that, like, Taylor's like, no, Idolan, you can't come here because Jack might influence you because something might happen and, and we wouldn't be able to stop you. And here we have Dragon that's actively doing this. What, um, like what's gonna like she's the same way like how how would you stop her 
outside of well, well we'll see yeah yeah i didn't draw it out but there's the, the thing where she like automatically blurs out and, and mutes and, and scrambles whatever the nine are saying because she's sort of trying to do this quarantine but she she is fighting them so yeah yeah it's not a very thorough quarantine i think so as saint is watching he also looks over all the other major threats the dragon is aware of um and we sort of passingly become aware that there are a barrage of terrifying looking things that are always happening in the background that she's always kind of keeping tabs on yeah and 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 just after we do this whole beat establishing you know how scary powerful dragon is now we now we go into this beat that establishes why that might be necessary so once again it's like yes yes she's crazy strong crazy powerful she can deal with these problems with ease but look at all this terrible awful stuff that she's keeping in check so isn't that a good thing right yeah it's like a dialogue yeah so so mags brings coffee for saint uh and together they discuss the fact that jack hasn't deployed the siberians or gray boy yet actually they probably don't know that there's only one gray boy at this point but yeah 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 and and a, a good reminder that they're that that while the good guys are, are basically pulling out all stops to win while, while while dragon is basically rewriting the last of her her code to get around her restrictions that the end game really hasn't even started yet that the jack is still just playing with people and and it's only going to escalate from here and I, I again a great part of this is, is we're starting to understand both dragon and saint's reasoning for why they feel the need to act decisively here they're being pushed into a corner by that constant escalation jack's mental manipulation is working on this global scale to where people who aren't even involved in the fight saint are feeling the pressure of it and feeling the need to act and act immediately in some way yep yep um just kind of thrown in here we we learned that Weaver is heading for Ellisburg, even though Dragon tells her she won't be able to help. That the, the Azazel are going to handle everything. Don't worry about it. Dragon's got this covered. Weaver's not going to have to go into Ellisburg. That's certainly not going to happen. Yep. <laughs> Quarantine still applies to you, Weaver. No, d- don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, right. So Saint goes to PP and thinks about his backstory and how he doesn't have powers, which I'm not sure if we knew that, actually. No, we did not. And I think this is really huge and important part of his character, that he is living in this world of superpowered people, and he is not one. And so his his mission, his his mission statement, his reason for existing is dragon, is this thing. And I think that very much defines his mindset, that this is all he has to live for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. So when we get back... Uh, to the to his desk he realizes that he's been made by dragon and she's coming after him and he starts trying to head off her attack um and we find that he has access to her internals in kind of a privileged way and that and he decides that there's nothing else to be done she's going to get him so he decides he needs to use the ascalon program yeah which is a super dramatic thing to say if you're a nerd like we are and know the word origin of ascalon at which point i said Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Are we gonna talk about that during name game? I think we will. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the book says it itself. Like, um, you're right. But I, I like there's there's this beat here that I want to pull out again because it, it echoes the things we've been talking about. That 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 Saint feels a bit of a thrill as the duel began. This was the ultimate hunt, fighting an enemy that was bigger, smarter, faster, an enemy that couldn't truly die because she wasn't truly alive. Now this this echoes saint's justification that 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 dragon is not really alive and therefore killing her isn't really killing anyone but also just like idolan just like taylor just like jack saint lives for this and he's excited by the conflict and he's excited by the fight and it is it is key to everything that he he is yeah it's it's almost like yet again we have another non-cape who is just as uh, screwed up or at least uh, twisted in some particular way as a lot of the capes are yeah so then at this point he has a flashback or at least we get a, a you know an image of uh the salvage dive into the sunken ruins of Newfoundland looking for mementos for for the families and he tracks a radio signal a beacon Richter's it contains directions to find a weapon that can be used to find control or kill his AI creations and thusly we have saint who who like we said was not gifted with any power 
but he is gifted with a tool and he's gifted with a purpose and, and a meaning. And he understandably in this moment pursues it with everything he is. He becomes yeah. fully, fully uh, taken over by it. Yeah. So back in the present, they debate whether dragon um, could be the one who causes the end of the world, which I don't think the text had drawn our attention to that possibility yet explicitly, but they certainly are considering it and seem like they have been. And after seeing how easily she, she thrashes those strong slaughterhouse nine capes, it does seem a little bit plausible. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where, where the text doesn't do it implicitly, but I think as a reader, you're kind of drawn back to that Taylor. I don't conversation from the last chapter where you realize that, that yeah, what, what happens if it's a person who can't be stopped? And if, if dragon is well on her way to a point where she can't be stopped, it is, is acting right now the only thing we we can do that we, that we have to do it yep which he does he pulls the trigger he he uses ascalon and at that point dragon tries to take over his computer and uh and then sees what he's doing and realizes it's too late and then she just kind of talks to him basically begging at this point and uh and he kind of tells her you know that she's a, a machine and and a monster and and so forth and and she says, I disagree on every count. I was the one who made me, who defined myself. This creator is no god, only a cruel, short-sighted man. Tomatoes, tomatoes. Do me one favor. Tell death. Aww. Aww. All the dragon ships that everyone is relying on to fight the Nine all land and shut down. And there we go. Dragon is dead. And at the moment where we possibly needed her most... Because she was going to stop Jack from getting to Nilbog, but no more. Um, so let's we'll get into this in, in a few minutes, but let's go ahead and, and finish the chapter up first. Yeah. So Defiant tunes in. I'll kill you for this, the cyborg said. There was no emotion in his voice, and somehow that was more disturbing. So as Saint dehumanizes Dragon and c- consistently refuses to consider that she has any personhood, he consistently refers to Defiant as a cyborg, um, as the cyborg, in fact, uh, even though cyborg, I mean, Defiant is a man. He's he's just a man who replaced a lot of parts of his body yeah. with machines, and I don't know, possibly some of his brain. We don't know, but the point is, he's, he's totally a guy. So it's 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 a obvious like like uh, othering tactic, like like you've like you've said to to call him the cyborg. Yeah, yeah, and that I mean, <laughs> it's hard not to echo that back to Taylor and her ability to to attempt to ignore the 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 deaths of people around her right so she could do her thing that's kind of what saint is doing here and i'm not i'm not drawing a a specific line to them because i think saint is is a dick but um i i just think that's a a very kind of intentional callback and Mm -hmm. like it it's it is really telling that that yeah he can't even humanize defiant yep so saint then be prepares to become dragon to take up her duties through the amputated parts of her that remain yeah so so all this power in the hands of dragon is unsafe and scary and could bring about the end of the world but in the hands of saint it's perfectly safe right matt that's that's totally fine of course that's that's what's funny is is when you're faced with one of these like prophecy into the world things you, you there's no there's no right move because you never know if it's like well maybe this Maybe this is what causes the end of the world. Maybe maybe Dragon was the only thing standing between us and the end of the world. And now, yeah. But Saint is vastly relieved to find that Dinah's latest numbers say that the chance of success today just jumped, tripled, actually. Uh, reason unknown. Yeah, and, and it serves in Saint's mind to almost immediately vindicate him right that that Mm -hmm. he he now feels i made the right decision because our chances of success have now tripled and of course we need to remind ourselves that correlation does not equal causation and we actually have no idea um if if the event here improved their odds or if it was something else unrelated or any of a million million different things that could tie into these predictions and what happens so yeah uh yeah and so he's sitting there you know receiving this flood of data coming in and he finds that it's too much there's too many emergencies there's too many things to account for and he doesn't even know which are important so so he he poured through them some kid inquiring about an inbringer cult a case 53 appearance in ireland with deaths a woman claiming she could control scion a tinker (coughs) claiming he had a bomb 
that could start a new ice age, which were important, which could he afford to ignore? Yeah, that's a, a really subtle reminder that there's that woman out there that can control Scion. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is like this is what we've been saying that you know you, you act, you make these decisions because you feel like they're the right thing to do is to save the world, and there's these consequences you didn't think about. This idea that Dragon was doing so many things that we didn't fully understand, so many things to to uh, possibly keep bad things at bay, to prioritize and to control all these terrible things that were happening and and saint is not an ai saint is not a person that is equipped to handle this and and it, so so the question of if you stop one threat did you possibly just create a whole bunch of new ones that you haven't even seen yet right yeah yeah i mean that's that's the uh the, the, isn't there a word for this paradox is like is this a cassandra situation is that, is that the same thing or is that a different thing? I, I, yeah, I, don't I know. mean, there's, a, I'm sure there's a, there's a term for it, but yeah, what it is, I'm not sure. Yeah. Right. So as he's looking through things, he becomes aware of, uh, Amelia's panacea's file from the birdcage. Um, I think he notices this when he's trying to talk to teacher actually, because that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of why he was looking at the birdcage. Um, and he finds it's corrupted. It's blocked from dragon's sight by a, coincidental occurrence of the code that blinds dragon yeah if um if you guys couldn't couldn't tell matt uh put coincidental in quotes because it's it's definitely not coincidental at all yeah um I and mean, you remember when that happened yeah right? that was the the seamurgs yeah. move right that yeah just so happened to scramble the message right as it went out yeah right yeah all right scott same all right I want to hear. I want to hear your opinion first, and then we'll go into mine. I think that, uh, from Saint's point of view, this move made sense. I do think that his finger was on the scale in the sense that he, this decision also happens to benefit him personally and be in line with his biases. I'm someone who's very biased against just like letting AI have free reign. Um, I, I'm completely in the AI, you know, our, our dangerous camp. Um, but knowing what I know about dragon from reading this, the whole story and having insight into her POV, I don't think dragon is bad. I'm saying that from saints point of view, based on what he knows, it's understand. It's an understandable decision. The timing uh, you want, you want to say the timing is really bad, but you could also just say, Hey, the, the timing, if anything, like this is this this is the time because things are getting worse and worse and it just you know it's it's a like like you said I don't want to I don't want to refuse to come down on a side but it there's so much stuff in the chapter where it's like well a little bit of column A a little bit of column B and uh, it's really hard to be to be clear on it and, and to be I can't do my normal what would John Luke Picard do thing here because (laughs) it's just like well i mean this is this is not um this is not clear cut to me yeah yeah i i i want to say some some clarifiers here i think we need to say that dragon is alive for this to be any kind of yeah actual debate that that dragon whether whether or not this was code meant to mimic consciousness at some point it stopped just being that and it was some form of consciousness i think I think her final words being a, a trying to get a message out to the person she loves is almost a conclusion on that on that front that that the last thing she wants to say is is tell Dr- defiant presumably I, I love him or something that's what I'm assuming I, I don't I don't know but that her the last thing she says is she realizes she's going to die is a message to her loved one that is consciousness that is life that is real um, yeah and, I think if you've if you've made something that's begging not to be killed. And, and that behavior is not something you programmed into it explicitly, then right. you should probably not kill that thing. Right. The other thing I think we need to put as a, a constant in this argument is that Saint is a dick. <laughs> and I, I really think yeah. Saint is a dick. I think Saint is um, convinced of his own importance via this, this thing that fell into his lap. I think he writes his own rules. I think he is fine using the AI when they specifically benefit him, but, but worries about it when, um, when, when it is, it is dealing with other people. I think 
His decision here, as much as he wants to not admit it, was primarily motivated by the fact that she was going to find him, that he had to do it now, not really because she was about to cross a threshold where the thing wouldn't stop, but because he was about to get busted. And that being said, I do understand his reasoning. I can, I can, I can see a place where he got to where he legitimately felt that he had to do this. The problem is he, he set this up to where like, why is his, why is his finger the one on the button? Why is he the only one that gets to make the decision? Why did the dragon slayers find this thing and decide that we three or, or however many of them are, we just see three central ones, but why are, do, are we the only ones that get to make the decision? Why do we not loop in other people? Why do we not loop in a, a council of people? Why is it just us and no one else? And we do this our way and our way only. And and that's where I start to have trouble with it. Because and, and the answer to that is not because I don't think he was worried, but because he wanted to feel important. He wanted to feel like he was the person and this was his thing and his thing alone. And so he had to be the one to do it. And and so you start getting into these these gray areas of maybe he made the right decision for him but but his actions were motivated by other things yeah that's very reminiscent of this theme that we just saw with idolan and, and taylor where where the decision makes sense inside their head and inside their narration but you can't discount the fact that they're desperate to feel relevant and and to remain right. relevant and uh right. They're not they're not actually putting that on their pros and cons list, but it's certainly motivating their reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. So so was Saint wrong? I I don't I don't know. What do I think Saint was motivated by things beyond what he was willing to admit? Do I think the timing of it had to be just then? Do I think that it had to be just his decision? Do I think that there's a bunch of other things we could have done instead of this? Absolutely. But do I understand how he got to the place where he said yes yeah 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 but he's such a dick (laughs) yeah i'm really wondering what john luke picard would do here i'm i i I was thinking about it i'm thinking maybe he would lean toward not killing i think he would see it as i don't think he would ever write it off as a non-living thing yeah i mean he didn't even want to kill the borg no (laughs) he he was really resistant to kill the borg yeah, he argued in court for Data's personhood, so yeah, that's exactly yeah. exactly this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to be able to offer any more clarity on this. Sorry. Yeah, just remember, guys, be nice to each other. I understand you're passionate. I understand some of you are going to agree with us. Some of you are going to not agree with us. That's the nature of these things. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I think, like like you said, the the point is that the text is almost playing with us in, in in the sense that it's keeping the scales balanced. It's not a lot of these moral quandaries. I, I feel like I come down pretty hard on one side or the other. This one is just like, no, no, the, the text is, in, it seems to be intentionally making you uncertain. And yeah, that's, well, well, and it, it, it kind of ties into the why budding we've talked about before, you know, the, the definition of why bud is, is, in my opinion, when the text is telling us a certain thing and people are either not are choosing not to or not intentionally missing what I think the text is trying to say. I think mm-hmm. the text in this case is very much trying to say there is no easy answer and there are arguments to be had on both sides. And it absolutely makes sense. This is one of the most contentious arguments in this story because it is it is almost set up that way. So it, it total sense to me. I, I, I think there's there's no one i think that is just totally flat out wrong in this argument yeah i think um, you're right even even if i would disagree with them on some points so yeah right i agree with you all right let's let's move past this into 26.4 and the fallout of this event so weaver is riding her dragonfly to ellisburg and she's thinking to herself about what ellisburg means to people yeah, Ellisburg is like a, a mini version of what the world could look like as a whole if one person uh, rises to enough power to where they just control everything and are unstoppable. Uh, that's a really great comparison as you ride into the city. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting contrast. And... But who's who's it going to be? Right. It's going to be can't be Dragon anymore. Is it going to be yep. Idolan? It's going to be Scion, Taylor. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> So the dragonfly abruptly sets down, and Dragon is unresponsive to Taylor's requests for information. 
She sees that all the Azazels are just dormant and sees the dragon isn't getting her messages. So she contacts Defiant, who seems emotional. She tell, uh, He tells her teams from across America are joining the fight now that the cover is blown and that Jack is already in Ellsberg. I, I, I like, like, Defiant is in really rough shape here. And, and he just had his poor heart broken. And, and Weaver, bless her, says, focus on dragon, focus on, on damage control. And Defiant gives this very uncharacteristically Defiant answer, which is just, thank you, Weaver. And you're just like, oh, this poor guy is, is just a wreck. And, yeah. and forget everything I said in the final in the last chapter. Fuck you, Saint. I hate you forever. This is awful and sad. Yeah. I'm sad. Yeah, take it, take it all back. Yeah, take it all back. Yeah. So she guesses that Dragon is kept alive with cybernetics and maybe having problems with her equipment. Yeah, um, and, and she's so close to figuring it out, right? I think like one more little bit of clue, and I think Taylor will have put the Dragon as AI puzzle together, but mm-hmm. it might not matter anymore because she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so she makes her way inside and into Ellisburg through the giant steel doors that have been effortlessly torn down by the Siberian clone. Weaver tries to bargain with her passenger, but gets no indication that it's listening. Yeah, so remember when a few chapters ago when she said that she had that dark evil side of her totally under control, and now she's freely admitting that that side could take over if she ever ever loses consciousness or anything and then just hopes that she can steer it towards the bad guy. We're doing we're doing really great here. Yeah, really she's, she's real confident in her uh, in her control there. Yeah, totally, totally. So she she tries to scout the area with bugs, but they're rapidly eaten by frog tongues, which flick out of nowhere, which is foreboding. The buildings and trees have been remodeled into a whimsical wonderland, and a smallish nilbog creation, a lizard boy, sneaks up on her. A girl with a swollen bulbous head sneaks up on her as well, and the two of them disarm her violently when she doesn't comply the way they want. They bring a giant monster to tear the robot arms off of her her flight pack and uh, ultimately succeed. Yep, this is uh, totally normal. No, nothing weird at all here. At all. This is such a delightful part of the story. It really is. So happy this is in here. (laughs) So eventually Weaver tells them that she has a gift for Nilbog and they relax and they bring her to Nilbog's table. I just want to point out that all of these things speak English, meaning that they're all fairly intelligent. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. how much of of living conscious beings are they? Um, just like we had this argument about a, a, a robot AI. Yeah. Are they are they cognizant of their existence? Are they alive? Are they? Yeah. We're gonna I mean, mercilessly slaughter a shit ton of these things. Right. These they're poor, these poor pathetic creatures. They're created life, but they're, yeah. if anything, you know, in, on the normal human spectrum of things, they're more real than than dragon was yeah. because they're yeah. biological. Yeah. Yeah. Um so so eventually yeah, so so um they they relax, they bring her to Nilbog's table, and Jack, uh, Siberian and Bonesaw are dining with him amidst the huge mass of his goblins. She can't find the Manton, uh, so she's at a strong disadvantage in this situation. Basically the Siberian could just tear her apart at any moment. Yeah. And thus begins the most fi- fucked up dinner party I've ever seen. And I've watched all three seasons of the Hannibal TV show. So <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. So she starts off on the wrong foot with Nilbog by not being sufficiently obsequious. And he tells her uh, that, uh, she, sorry, she tells him that she was a queen in her own land. And then he cheers up a bit when she offers a gift. She brings her swarm in and feeds his minions. And uh, then she's kind of scouting around looking for the manthan. And she discovers a number of his creatures underground and then also discovers Nilbog himself is underground too, attached to the surface, and that what, sh- what she's seeing at the surface is a decoy. Hey, that's pretty similar to Weaver, like using decoys and feeding bugs with other bugs, other things. Yeah, similar. it's probably a common master concept, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Weaver tells her story, her, her fairy tale, as it were. Uh, she was a, a god in her domain with loyal subjects and allies, and she says, I was more powerful than you. Um, and then she she relates to him that Jack said that he would come back from his long sleep and destroy all kingdoms. Yeah, the, the great thing about this fairy tale is that she's not really lying. Like, she's telling a story, and she's kind of, like, formatting it for Nilbog's, like, medieval sensibility. But 
she's not lying. She's telling the truth. She was basically the queen of the area and gave it up. And and Jack is trying to destroy everything. So she's not having to lie to this guy to try to to dissuade him. Yeah, it occurs to me that this is similar to um to her ability to kind of get into um Rachel's head and, yeah. and kind of understand how to how to speak the language of the person she's talking to. Absolutely, yeah. So Nilbog uh, makes an angel and a devil creature. Um, Weaver ends up taking the devil. Well, I mean, technically Jack chooses to take the angel, so she like gets saddled with the devil, uh, which is pretty fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a. Uh, a lot, a lot of parallels there. Yeah. So they pause to have their meal of regurgitated slop. And and it tastes like cupcakes, Bonesaw said, around a mouthful. I just I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. Um the weird thing about like this moment and every other Bonesaw moment in this chapter is that now like Every time I hear her talk and see her do things, I'm like, oh, my God, she's just pretending there's a poor girl inside there who, like, is aware of all these terrible things she does and is, is trying desperately to find a way to, like, like not not necessarily redeem herself, but, like, get to get to a, a, a better place. But she feels trapped and it's just like, oh, my God, this is awful. Yeah. Um, th- so this part was just really creepy to me. So I'm just going to read this. Um I started to move my mask to eat and be polite, then noted how Jack was holding his knife. The blade swayed back and forth in the air as he chewed, his eyes rolled back and looking up at the overcast sky above. The blade was making crisscrosses in the direction of my throat. He glanced down, meeting my eyes, and smiled. (laughs) So, Matt, we're sitting at a crazy dinner table, surrounded by scary mutated monsters, watching characters eat purple vomit that tastes like cupcakes, while other monsters are engaged in a gladiatorial combat thing. And yet, Jack playing with a butter knife and smirking at Taylor is the creepiest part of all of this. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. Uh, That's just such a great touch. Yeah. So after the meal, Jack makes his pitch. uh, His pitch to, to convince Nilbog. The world is stagnant, he says, and he wants to wipe the slate clean. Nilbog will be able to take over the world, according to Jack. Yeah, and I think once again, like, we got this idea from the first time we met Jack that that he has this other kind of hidden power, this, like, maybe maybe he's, like, part thinker or something that, that, that this deep connection to his passenger allows him to, like, read people a little bit, um, and he's using it here again, uh, and, and, and Taylor, like, as smart as she is, like, kind of never had a shot because he has this this power yeah yeah i, mean, I think we're, we're definitely led to believe that at this point and i mean as smart as she is as good as she is at getting into nilbog's head he's he's got like six layers of of preparation on her mm-hmm. so golem shows up at this point and he says he will stand for the innocence he tells nilbog to listen to the queen and suddenly, this is like, I love when things come full circle. I love it so much because suddenly that beautiful heroic moment we saw of Golem back in that first chapter is back. And and Golem here exists independent of Jack and Taylor, who he called uh, very similar at the beginning of the chapter. And and, and he's not one of those, that, that angel or that devil. He's not that. He speaks for the innocents. And, and for the sake of the innocent, he begs Nilbog to listen to Taylor, to do nothing and therefore save everything. And it's just this perfect kind of roundabout way where he can, because he's not like them, because he doesn't exist for that escalation, for that combat, he can, he can be this tiebreaker. And it's so wonderful. Like I didn't even realize that's what we were setting up in that moment, but it's here and it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating in in a good way because Nilbog seems to be swayed by everything everyone says. He's like, oh yeah. yes, you're right, yeah. Jack. Oh no, yes, you're right, you're right, Queen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then finally, it, it's almost like Jack has been playing up to this point, because then he pulls out his trump card, which is just what Nilbog actually cares about, which is the fact that his creatures are dying, and he doesn't have the resources that he needs to keep them alive. Um, and if he listens to Jack, he can take all the resources he needs, and on top of that, Bonesaw can make him immortal. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, you're absolutely right that he was just playing with them. And that's classic Jack, right? Like he, he strings them along just enough to make them think that they might have a chance at winning. And then he pulls out the card that he was always going to play the whole time. He could have certainly played this at the very beginning and would have just won. But that's not Jack. He wants to give them a little bit of hope first and then take it away from them. Right. Yeah. You, you kind of have to assume that he played this situation perfectly. So Weaver finally points out um, the hidden Manton to Nilbog. She's kind of grasping at straws. I don't know exactly how she thinks this is going to play out, uh, but this does rapidly lead to a fight uh, where Weaver ends up trying to kill Nilbog uh, with her subterranean bugs. Um, and Jack then cuts her out of the sky with his, with his power and Siberian draws Nilbog up to the surface and they basically abscond with him through a to- toy box portal. Yeah, that uh, did not did not go well. Did not yep. go well. Yep. And we just move right into twenty six point five without without pause. Nope. Ellisberg splits open at the seams, disgorging demons from inside the structures and underground. Golem and Weaver are rescued, and the amassed heroes fight the monsters as, as they overflow the city wall. Uh, I want fan art of this. Oh my god! This is my weekly fan art request: is <laughs> hundreds of 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 twisted. Um, um, Jim Henson creatures um, <laughs> trying to escape a, a walled city while fighting, being fought back by heroes. I mean, how awesome is that? Like, it, just the image and, like, the one character that swaps in, like, hills to replace the door and, like, there's just, like, desperation and everyone's fighting and, like, the the flying ones are, like, flying over the wall to test the, the like, oh my god, it's so awesome. Yeah. It's so awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, Golem, uh, you know, the, now Taylor and Golem are, are outside. They've been kind of rescued. Golem seems really demoralized. Uh, there are now four separate flashpoints caused by the Nine by Jack. And, and in Golem's estimation, Jack is winning. And at first, Taylor kind of pushes back against that. But then she's like, nope, yeah, he, he is kind of winning. Yeah, yeah. And and you get the feeling there that it's just going to ramp up. I mean, we've kind of seen it. It started with one attack, then two consecutive attacks, then three at the same time. And now we've got four at the same time. And it's going to go five, then six. And it's just like it, it's very reminiscent of how Jack kind of um, messed with Bonesaw, right? That like mm-hmm. you just like she keeps having to repair her parents until she's eventually so exhausted that she just gives up and wants to let it go. And that's very much what he's doing here on a on a kind of global scale. And it's it's awful. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the exact same kind of psychological warfare. It's, you're right. So Weaver, at this point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the rest of this chapter pretty much is mostly her watching what other groups are doing through cameras and talking to them over radio, right? She's yeah. not she's not going to these places. No, yeah, she's, she's sitting to... outside of Ellisburg, um, kind of Ha- like partially watching the battle in Ellisburg while yeah while di- basically sit sitting in for the dragon roll and and coordinating for these guys and coaching them through battles yeah that's what I thought so Weaver watches the other group uh fighting through their cameras and we see skin slips power which is uh uh slurping around by having a really elastic skin, which they can kill people and steal their skins and stitch onto his skin. Yeah, and then control that too. It's fucking, it's fucking gross as shit. <laughs> it's really gross. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I it's great. Know, like, it's fantastic. I don't even know how you sit down in, in front of a computer and say, today I'm going to invent a superpower <laughs> where someone stretches their skin around to fly around and then enhances their power by flaying people and putting their skin you know we talked to wild Bo a lot because he, he follows <laughs> the podcast and and we talked to this nice guy who's, who's fr- so friendly and nice and then it's like skin power man <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i don't uh i, I don't I don't have the capacity to think of that power, and I, but I'm, you know, I'm glad that someone does. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's like, it's disgusting and gross, and of course it's meant to be. It's, it's brilliant. It's like so inventive and creative to come up with something like that, but and, yeah. And I do, I do find that I can render exactly what that would look like in my mind effortlessly, which yeah. is nice yeah. to know about myself. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Foil's group is fighting skin slips, murder rats, and uh, miasmas, plus a hatchet face. 
they're still fighting really hard and it's it seems rough for weaver to watch because she can't be there yeah because she can't really do anything and, and you can you can you can feel the desperation in 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 their voices that they're like struggling to defeat these guys they're like barely hanging on and 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 they like just trying to eke out some kind of victory and in this moment you kind of hear taylor like she thinks to herself escalations and and t- to get back to what we were talking about this whole time i think this is where i think redoing the slaughterhouse nine again really works to drive home this theme of escalations a lot because like we said jack's plan is basically the same same type of plan it was before only bigger taylor's plan to defeat him at the end of the day what she decides to do here in this chapter is basically kind of a rehash of what they did before aka stop playing his game take the fight directly to him throw all your cards on the table and and hope that you win um but because We've seen it in a very small form, in a very local city form, because we're seeing it in global now. It's very easy to draw those lines, and you have a very clear picture of what escalation looks like in practice. That it was this one contained thing, and now it's big, it's everywhere, it's global, it's world-changing. And this is this is what happens. This is how things escalate and how things get worse and worse. And and because we can draw those clear lines between them, it it, it nails that theme, I think. And that's why I, that's why I like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. It's um, it's perfect. Yeah. And uh, speaking of escalations, what's uh, what's Tecton doing right now, Matt? Is he uh, escalating? Well, he's 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 up against eight Siberians. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. Right. And and I think that's it's interesting. Like. I'm 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 trying to think back to to when I first read this because I definitely did feel that that was like uh, oh we've we've watered down the idea of Siberian now because we're fighting eight Siberians and in fact we're about to beat them, um, um but I think actually that's fine because once you know the trick of how Siberian works, it's uh, it's not nearly the same level of problem as it was when they thought Siberian was just an invulnerable woman. Right, right. Um, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of kind of built in explanations for that. That's one of them. I think they've specifically said that the, the the clone versions of these people are clearly not as crisp as the original. You know, copies yeah. of people like they're not they're not quite as as good. They're not as smart and they're not as quick moving. They're yeah. kind of more doughy and and easy, more easily defeated. So you you've got in built in reasons. But yeah, I mean right. it's. It's yeah. the The greatest part of her power was the unknown part of it. Yeah, and and they don't have the memories really. They they right. have the fabricated life that Bonesaw made for them, but that doesn't mean they have the years of combat experience that that the actual right, right. Mem- member did have. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, like you said, eight Siberians. Um. Basically, all of them except the one that's with Jack, uh, with a cube full of mantons, uh, presumably. Weaver suggests that they open a hole under the one carrying the cube. Yeah, and um, basically, basically, Weaver is just like demonstrating how hopeless the situation is for them. Is like, sorry guys, there's like nothing you can do here. You can try to open a hole under her; it's probably not going to work. Her her advice to them is basically just leave, um, which would of course let civilians die, and that is something that Tecton has a lot of trouble with, understandably. And it, but. But I mean, Weaver kind of makes a good point here that if you engage, you're going to die, and then the civilians will die anyway. Um, so, so like, but it's it's very hard to tell a person that it's very hard to say you're going to have to stand back and let them die. And of course, we're reminded of the time where Taylor had to do that, where she had to, like, as they were setting up their initial play on on the the nine way back in arc, whatever that was, they had to kind of watch them, you know, take people down and waiting to get them in the perfect position so something mm-hmm. that tecton probably hasn't had to deal with before but but taylor's an old pro at it now yeah yeah definitely so weaver tells defiant that they need to be able to break into the portal in ellisburg that uh that jack just used to leave so she wants to go all in now she wants to bring all their tools to bear all of her sub- subordinate teams are, are pulled from their various conflicts and kind of brought together and defiant will also be there soon in a, in a pendragon yeah, so Weaver Beast basically says she's putting together a team, a team of the best of the best, an elite strike force to go deep into the heart of enemy territory, a one-way mission to bring this battle to the enemy, and uh, a suicide squad of some sort. Um, 
Oh, I'm, just gonna keep, I'm just going to keep working Academy Award winning Suicide Squad into every conversation. Because, yeah, that's um, that's an improvement. Yeah, but I think from here on, the cool thing that I, the, the structural thing that happens in the rest of this arc now is we have a countdown. Defiant is on his way. The team is going in T minus 20 minutes or so. And the chapter kind of counts that down for us as we're leading up to this. So there's all these little mini skirmishes going on while Taylor is waiting for her her ultra team to to get to her to go on this mission yeah we've we've got uh her watching a group of dragon's teeth with jouster and hoyden making their way through an area and getting picked off by psychosoma who kind of uh in taylor's words does to a man's body what vista does to terrain kind of turning him into a monster there's also nixes and night hags we we haven't really seen night hags power that i can recall but it's like she kind of subsumes into surroundings and and it, it it reminds me actually of um annex but it's substantially different yeah 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 this is all this is all very cool and i think the, the important thing to remember once again is that taylor's not just watching this that she's she's counseling them she's coordinated she stepped into that dragon and defiant role because dragon's dead and defiant is having to to manage all this stuff that dragon no longer is so she's being their kind of all-seeing eye she's being that coordinator she's managing multiple teams simultaneously it's kind of like all these capes have become part of taylor swarm in a little bit in a a, a not not literal way but that she's controlling all these different battles now yeah i mean this this is her nature you know we've seen it we've seen it for almost since the beginning is that she will she can't help herself from taking a leadership role and and it's and she has pushed the world around until it just gave her that leadership role and now she's coordinating essentially all of the major you know important battles in 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 this in this situation it's it's pretty cool actually yep yep um we have this moment jouster moved to strike the light post again only for black hands to grab him and pull him into darkness and illusory fog the image on my screen distorted then went utterly black there was a sound like a slow wet a, like a slow wet grinding sound chewing as if from a dozen mouths at once <laughs> and like again going back to that horror theme right like this is awful and this is this is this is i think the the watching someone die on camera and having their camera cut out and hearing the noises is kind of like a, a, a well a well tread uh trope in horror um, that that you know you have to see this and it's it's a way of of showing this like i i immediately thought of aliens and the first time that all the guys are attacked um way deep down in the colony and and ripley and the rest of them are just powerless watching them as their their view screens blink out one by one and all you can he- hear is screams and death and all this stuff it's such a great moment yeah yeah and there, there's been relatively few good guy deaths at least from the capes yeah um, you're right so this one yeah. stands out yeah poor jouster yeah, poor Jasper. We we like that guy. He's been around ever since um, the Echidna fight, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. So then, kind of at this desperate moment when all hope is lost, uh, Contessa and the Number Man show up through cauldron portals and absolutely wreck shit with like a minimum number of shots fired. Uh, I guess they decided that they would be useful here. Yay! Wait. Yay? <laughs> I don't, I don't know what to feel, Matt. Are we supposed to be? I'm so confused. I, I, I mean, it's definitely a really. It feels like a relief in this moment because. Yeah, but it's fucking cauldron. Yeah, well, and and we also get that beat where the only reason I think that they haven't been more involved, you could say, is that the same quarantine procedures apply to them. Right. Right. Um, because they're they're dangerous folks. Yeah, that's why they can't they can't go after Jack at all. So they really only engage here because they have seemed to determine that Jack is not here. Yeah, right. So yeah, ten, 10 minutes ago, right? The good guys arrive at the Manton Cube. Um the, there's this mo I think you pulled this out Yeah, where, I did. I where, really like where, this. Um um Taylor asks Tattletail, what is she asking her if if uh, uh if their plan is going to work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to to and, defeat and, the Manton Cube. Yeah, and, and Tattletail says yes, and Taylor says you're absolutely certain? 93% certain. That's not good enough. Jeez, you've lost your sense of humor these past few years. I'm kidding, I'm sure. Get it? Because she doesn't have one? Because yeah. that's the joke? Because she doesn't have a sense of humor? Yeah. Lisa, burn! Burn! 
Burn. So Clockblocker uses his powers to nullify the one remaining Siberian, uh, which is kind of neat. I don't think we knew that would work, uh, but yeah, it does. I don't think, yeah, it's like the unstoppable force against the immovable object or whatever. That was right, really two, interesting, yeah. Yeah, two two inviolable powers, I yeah. guess, cancel each other out. Yeah. Then he encases himself and his allies in, in an tent, you know, a tent, which he then makes impervious. Which is brilliant. Um, yeah, we haven't seen that before either, kind of pulling out all the stops here. Uh, one of the Thanda drops a building on the cube from a great height now that it's now vulnerable. And there you go. Killed eight Siberians. Yeah. Not just a great height, Matt. It, they drop it from the fucking stratosphere. It specifically <laughs> says the stratosphere. That's like, that's like what, that. like eight miles? Like, that's really fucking, I mean, that's like the mid layer, right? Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't remember science, but. That's yeah, I like, mean, I. You got to wonder if if Taylor is being hyperbolic here, but regardless, it's probably high enough that the building just kind of completely disintegrates into dust, and the yeah, mountains yeah. are likewise disaggregated. Yep. So then, a giant mannequin, actually a winter mannequin hybrid, shows up and throws a hatchet face into the midst of the heroes, which is a pretty cool little strategy because it just shuts off all their powers, and they have yeah. to fight the hatchet face, who's basically a brute, I think. Um, and this giant mannequin, more or less hand to hand, uh, I guess they, they have Rachel's dogs briefly. Um, Tecton, uh, Shigurs, the hatchet face with his, um, which is with his cavitating, uh, uh, knuckles. And Tecton nets the mannequin and Chevalier and, uh, uh, sorry, nets the mannequin and Chevalier crushes him with his sword. Yeah, they fucking win. Yep. Um, and this is, this is great because, we're basically seeing win after win after win here. Now we're counting down the time we're, we're doing this slow countdown and we're seeing everyone win, but they're not actually winning. We know it's a hollow victory. We know it's not real. We know that the thing that they have to do, the thing that's coming next, the thing that we're counting down to is the only part of this battle that actually matters. And it's just like you, you feel that with, with this constant reminder of that clock. Yep. So we have this where, um, Tecton wants to come. He says, I- I'll come on this mission if you have use for me. I do. I'll come as well, Chevalier said. You're injured. A pause, as if waiting for me to realize what I was saying. This was the guy that had gone up against Behemoth face to face, scarcely an hour after suffering critical injuries in an assassination attempt. I'll come, he said again. <laughs> I love that moment. I just yeah. think that's really great. Yeah. Um, I love Chevalier. I love him so much. So we've assembled our team. We've got Chevalier, Revel, Hoyden, Tecton, Foil, Parian, Defiant, Rachel and the Dogs, and Weaver uh, with some dragon's teeth. Get onto the Pendragon and head. Um, I'm having a computer freak out. Just a second. Head uh, back into Ellisburg. Um, basically the middle of Ellisburg where all of those monsters were. Um Oh, G- Golem also shows up, of course, and he seems really defeated, which is kind of not good at this moment. Yeah, yeah. That's fucking Severance Samurai time, Matt. Our team is recruited. They're all volunteers. I'll be here because they want to help, ready to fucking defend those villagers from the bandits. Wait, that's the, <laughs> I got confused. That's the movie. Seven Samurai is a great movie. If you haven't seen it, go see the freaking movie. It's so good. It's so good. Um, yeah, and and and. I think I think the beat about this I like the most is like just as they're about to go in, just as they're about to attack, we get three more locations where where there's announced attacks. Three more people are attacking, and and this time Harbinger is is in there. So remember how Number Man just went in there and like wrecked shit with Contessa and defeated all of them. Well, now there's a bunch of them, and they're backed up by no bog monsters, and like just 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 to to, to drive it home again that that the stakes here are this is it. It's only going to get worse going out from here. This is it. It's all or nothing. This is the team. These 10 people are going to succeed or we're fucked. Yep. Yep. That, that's, that's a good, that's a good point that, that we haven't seen any of the Harbingers. We haven't seen, um, gray boy. Yep. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of aces that he's holding up his sleeve and yeah, off we go into the lion's den. Yeah. And, and I, I was not happy about having to, cut this one off halfway yeah um, neither was but, i but if we're gonna stop halfway through an arc this is a hell of a stopping spot right i mean this is like the perfect place to stop so yeah 
so yeah, just you know, for everyone's reference, that you know, we usually try to split the arcs as close to fifty percent of the way through the arc by word count as we can. Um, this this week, fifty percent of the arc by word count was actually the end of twenty six dot four. Yeah, um, but we it was decided. I you know I talked to various folks and I kind of had my own opinion that that it would make more sense to make this break here because this is where we're about to plunge into this. Uh, you know, no holds barred, pulling out all the stops, um, kind of final final run, or at least that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it was a good call. I'm glad we stopped here. I think stopping after the Saint, uh, well, we, would, we wouldn't have stopped after the Saint chapter, right? We would have stopped literally after halfway through the Nobog stuff. So it would have been this weird kind of yeah, not a great drop point. off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah all right. Um, well, uh, so... So we did want to, did we want to talk about, um, you know what, I, I wanted to, to uh, talk about Ascalon, and, and I also wanted to talk about the fact that we see um, a, 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 war, a, a ward helping with the fight, and their name was, blanking on it. Romp? Romp. And if you look at the tags, there's no Romp. But there is a mock show. Oh, so, so that person that that Taylor tried to recruit and said that they would never join the wards. Yep, told her to go fuck herself. Yeah, is uh, helping. So <laughs> Taylor. So and I love that. That's so mi- it's so minor and it's minor to the extent that it's basically an Easter egg. But it's showing that Taylor's strategy all this time has actually helped. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 good. She she was doing good. Um, and yeah. Ascalon is that so I'm, I'm blanking on what Ascalon means I, I don't know so how. Ascalon is a is a lance or or sword it depends on which version of of the story you hear but that that St. George used to slay the dragon the, yeah so this is the mythical sword that was the dragon slayer um, so yeah I, when I heard that I was like oh no, <laughs> oh, yeah. no. And, and we've never talked about Saint's name either but Saint is definitely supposed to you know refer to a dragon slaying Saint yeah yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, that's that's it. Uh, how about some some speculations? We're all eagerly awaiting those. I have some this week, Matt. I remembered. I'm so right. proud of myself. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so first, let's clear some old ones. Um, I said Nobog was going to be recruited by the Slaughterhouse Nine. Uh, technically correct. Not so much yeah. recruited as stolen and forced. You know, recruited but... in the in the same sense as uh, as. Yeah, as a murder rat. <laughs> yeah, I guess they all. I guess that's really all how they're they're recruited. It's like even Bonesaw was re- recruited by horrible mind destroying torture. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so and then and then I said Saint is going to reveal what who Dragon is causing the removal of the prisoners from the birdcage. I'm going to go ahead and call this one correct. Not only because that's not how I think people are going to get out of the birdcage anymore, but. Dragon's dead now, so I don't think that reveal. Like my my idea there was like people are going to find out that Dragon's AI, and therefore trust of of Dragon in the PRT will be completely removed, and there'll be some weird legal things that happen because of that, and that's obviously not going to happen anymore. So I'm going to call that one wrong. Okay. All right. So now for new ones. Um, okay. F- first, this is one that I should have made last week, but I didn't think of it in time. Um, <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. Um, I'm going to say that 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 the the way the I've been talking about the birdcage prisoners forever, and I've been talking about an eventual jailbreak. I don't think it's going to be a jailbreak anymore. I think it's going to do exactly what we've been heavily hinted at in, in the past that um, these prisoners will be released to assist with the end of the world battle. They will decide that they need them to fight, and they will release them. Um, I think that's been pretty heavily hinted so far. So I think that's what's going to happen. Um, so that's number one. Number two is mostly uh, based on my extreme anger at Saint, but I think I think Saint's going to do a really crappy job as a, a dragon replacement, and I think people are going to die as a result of that. and And I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure how how Defiant's going to take that, but but I'm going to go ahead and say not well, Matt, not well. Okay. And then number three, I just want to have fun with this last one because we have our seven samurai. Or there's ten of them plus the plus the uh, the the red shirts, the dragon's teeth, which I don't, mm-hmm. they don't, you know, they don't count. Um, but uh, but so 
uh, I, I'm going to, because this, it, we're, if we're setting up a seven samurai thing, then some of these people have to die because that's what happens in seven samurai. Like half of the people die. So I thought it'd be fun just for me to predict which of these people I think are going to die in the uh, ensuing encounter. So here we go. Okay. Uh, I think Revel is going to die. I think Parian sadly is going to die. I feel like the, Parian and Foil are too happy as a couple. So we have to destroy them by ending the life of one of them. Um, I think w- at least one of the dragon's teeth are going to die. And then lastly, I don't think Golem's getting out of this thing alive, which makes me very sad. But um, I feel like this is this has been his entire purpose for these past two years, and he is going to see his purpose through to the end of of hopefully Jack, but also himself. All right. Good stuff. And that wraps up our coverage of part one of Arc 26 Sting. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussions and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve, so let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. Yeah, you can reach out to us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. My personal Twitter is at scottdaily85, and Matt's is at mail. Thank you. If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. This week, I finally got Matt to watch Rick and Morty, so he and I got together and talked about it. Uh, That was a really fun podcast that came out today as we're recording this, um, two days ago, as you were listening to it. It was good. Check it out. Um... Also, uh, you'll see all of our other weekly shows over at the Daily Planet podcast feed. Check them out, please. And uh, another friendly reminder that the Daily Planet book club live stream of Carrie by Stephen King is coming up a week from this Friday. That'll be November 10th at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. Um, If you haven't finished the book yet, me, uh, (laughs) me, uh, get reading, get reading like I need to. I, I have finished, Scott, so. I, I would like to add that that our, our number of participants and contributors in the so-called writers um, um, podcast has has doubled in the last week. I'm That's not awesome. sure why, but I'm 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 happy about it. And we talk about every single story that people submit on the so-called writers subreddit. So if you want to be involved in that podcast, if you want us to talk about your story on the podcast, just swing by uh, you know reddit.com slash r slash so-called writers and and do that and and it's fun everybody loves it um and uh if you like uh, any of these shows and want to support them we have a patreon page patreon.com slash daily planet films consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford special thanks to new planeteers phineas and andrew at the one dollar level and captain's planet von kai and will bring i love this back at the ten dollar level <laughs> apparently we stopped saying i love this I, I, did, I thought I thought I still said that a lot. I but. think I think your I love this count for this episode was pretty good, actually. Well, I loved it, so that makes yeah. sense. Good. Also, speaking of Patreon, make sure that you stop by Wildblow's page and toss some money there because he's the guy that makes and continues to make this whole thing possible. Yeah, he's pumping out new chapters, so so pump some money over there. That's right. I don't know if that verb really worked. <laughs> Um, And if you can't spare any extra cash at this moment, that's absolutely fine. Consider commanding your Cronenbergian mutant monsters subjects to spread from your kingdom and into the world and bring the good news of We've Got Worm. Hopefully they don't eat too many people while doing that. Or, or, or you can just head on over to iTunes and leave us a review and a rating. This week's week's review comes from Ass... who gives us five stars and says this podcast is excellent in its analysis and discussion of worm a man of few words but many f's in his name thank you ass and thank you everyone else who has reviewed and rated we've got worm and all of our great podcasts it really it really honestly does does help so much um that was the last new review we have so we don't have any for next week so someone please uh, review us so we can read one for next week or it's just going to be a really awkward segment of the podcast that's please, right please don't do you that. want us don't you want us to read your your beautiful review come yeah. on yeah <laughs> 
All right, that's it for us this week. Next week, we'll be finishing up Arc 26 Sting. Scott, any guesses as to what's going to happen? We're all going to die. Awesome. Well, we will find out next week on another exciting episode of We've Got Worm. 